Good morning. You're all very welcome to the Founders Day Online Conference 2020, Shaping the Future of Irish Mental Health Care. I'm conscious we're normally in the Jonathan Swift Theatre in St. Patrick's, looking out at a sea of faces, so it's slightly different this time around. But thanks so much for joining us, and we hope that you'll get involved, send questions throughout the morning, comments, etc. And hopefully, although it's a jam-packed schedule, we hope we'll have time at the end of each session for some questions and some comments and then a bit of discussion at the, at the very end. The day is going to be made up of three sessions, a morning, a mid-morning, and then a keynote address at the end. There's a broad range of speakers, as I'm sure you're aware, if you've been perusing the schedule and marking out who you definitely don't want to miss. It's a bit like customising your own Glastonbury or something. I'm sure you know, there's clashes in your day, but all of this will be recorded so you'll be able to access it uh, afterwards. At the end of each session, as I say, we will try to make time for questions. You can submit them with the little question box there in Zoom. And um, there, in terms of your CPD, if you're seeking CPD points from the conference, you can claim those by emailing communications at saintpatsmail.com. That's communications at saintpatsmail.com. One small thing on the questions, if you could at the start, sort of at, the speaker so that we know who your question is directed to. It may be obvious given the, the subject matter, but it'll just make it more efficient for us if you could let us know at the top of the question who you'd like us to direct it to. Okay, as I say, jam-packed schedule. So we'll move on without further ado and I'll introduce you to Professor Paul Fearon, who's medical director at St. Patrick's, and he's going to explain a little bit more about what's in store today. Hello, good morning everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's Founders Day at St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. Uh, this is actually an annual event held in recognition of Jonathan Swift, whose bequest in 1745 led to the creation of St. Patrick's Hospital, the first psychiatric hospital in the country. I'm very grateful to my predecessor, Jim Lucy, for reinvigorating Founders Day just over 10 years ago. And it's been a real privilege for me to help organize this year's event. This year's theme actually really chose itself we're living in a time where the mental health of our fellow citizens has come into sharper focus than ever before. Although we purposely admitted, uh, omitted the word COVID from today's title, its effects on our mental health and our, on the services that deliver mental health care has been profound. It's presented us with several challenges, but also opportunities both in how and where we work, how we collaborate and work together within and across services in times of need, and also in forcing us to really reevaluate how we can deliver excellent mental health care to those who really need it. I'm optimistic that we can learn much from how we've lived and worked together through this crisis and that we can continue to apply many of these lessons uh, usefully once the threat of COVID-19 has receded. But equally, the pandemic has further highlighted something that we've all known for several years, namely that mental health services are constantly under disproportionate pressure on several fronts and are in urgent need of renewal so that they can deliver the high quality care that we all wish for and indeed have a right to expect for our fellow citizens, our friends, our families, our loved ones, ourselves. In this context, the publication of the government's mental health policy sharing the vision is timely and I believe should be broadly welcomed and actively engaged with. So it seems natural then that despite all the unexpected changes over the last nine months that we come together and firmly grasp the opportunities posed by these challenges. And it's really in this context that I'd like in advance to thank all today's speakers for giving us their perspectives on how we might move forward together. We actually plan to produce a document outlining the main learning points of today's proceedings, and we'll disseminate this in various formats in the very near future. So now we're, I'm delighted to um, welcome Minister of State for Mental Health and Older People, Mary Butler, TD, to deliver our opening address. As many of you know, um, Minister Butler has represented Waterford in the Dáil since 2016 and was appointed as Minister for Health in July of this year. And I suspect that's been a rather interesting few months for her. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, on behalf of all of us to wish her the best of luck in her role in the forthcoming months and years. We also um, welcome her announcement uh, recently of the appointment of John Saunders and, as Independent Chair of the National Implementation and Monitoring Committee for the new mental health policy sharing the vision. So I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking time during her very this very busy period to join us today. So Minister Butler, you're very welcome. I'll hand over the virtual podium to you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you for your kind words of introduction. I would like to thank you, um, Professor uh, Fearon of St. Patrick's for inviting me today. <clears throat> as I indicated in previous discussions with St. Patrick's since my appointment as Minister, I am wholly committed to improving our mental health services. I am also pleased to help you celebrate Founders Day and the birth of Jonathan Swift. The choice of this year's team shaping the future of Irish mental health care has never been more apt. While we have recently launched a new 10-year policy sharing the vision to build upon a vision for change, we collectively in the sector have to continue all aspects of improvement, particularly in the face of COVID-19. We can together overcome challenges and maximize new opportunities. There is no doubt that the outbreak of COVID-19, both nationally and internationally, is a source of significant anxiety and fear for many people. Ireland has, relative to many other countries, acquitted itself well to a serious and evolving threat. While the government and all relevant sectors and agencies continue to play their part to successfully tackle COVID-19, the national response to date ultimately reflects the significant understanding and efforts of the Irish people for the common good. Our concerns arise not only from the disease itself, but also from the negative mental health impacts from increased isolation, disruption to daily life, or uncertainty around employment and financial security. By and large, our statutory and non-statutory mental health services have so far weathered the storm in the face of adversity on all the key fronts. Acute inpatient and community residential facilities have remained open, true, though under necessary protocols. Where numbers have been reduced in some settings, telehealth solutions have come to the fore to protect both service users and staff. Urgent cases determined by clinical assessment continue to be seen across mental health services, including emergency departments. HSE services in general have continued to operate at around 85% or above of pre-COVID levels. GP, hospital and mental health services remain open and people should continue to access these if they are concerned about their mental health. The Mental Health Commission has put in place a risk framework with contingency plans with each HSE CHO to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and to protect service users and staff. An oversight group comprising the Department of Health, the HSE and the Commission has been established to monitor and address COVID-19 concerns in the mental health area. The Department has also introduced primary legislation to facilitate the continued operation of mental health tribunals, and this was recently extended to June 2021. One of the opportunities arising from COVID, and there are few, has been the accelerated drive towards the use of digital health technologies and e-mental health generally in Ireland. An additional 2.2 million was allocated by government this year to develop improved psychosocial responses to COVID pressures. The wide range of such supports are to be found on yourmentalhealth.ie. A national and local radio campaign launched last month will run until the end of this year and promotes existing mental health services and supports. The potential use of technology should complement rather than replace face-to-face -face care. I know that St. Patrick's has been an advocate of such an approach over recent years and that you have honed your responses in this regard to COVID-19. I would be particularly interested to hear of your recent work on this, either today or by separate discussion in the future. Looking to the future, we recently, as many of you will be aware, refreshed our national mental health policy with the new sharing division, a mental health policy for everyone. The policy sets out a progressive shift in mental health service delivery from volume of supports provided to outcomes achieved for people using the services. Sharing the vision will build on the achievements of a vision for change with a focus on cross-sectorial and interdepartmental commitments to improving the mental health outcomes of Ireland's population across the life cycle. The policy seeks to enhance mental health services across a continuum of supports from mental health promotion prevention and early intervention to acute and specialist services, aiming to place the needs of the individual at the center of service delivery. Sharing the vision does not replace a vision for change, but rather it refines fundamentals and approaches in the light of evolving and widely agreed future needs. The implementation of sharing the vision is obviously critical to a success, and this is a core objective for me as minister. 
Last month, I announced the establishment of the new international, sorry, the new National Implementation and Monitoring Committee framework, which will be responsible with driving and overseeing implementation of the policy. Over the 10 year lifespan of share and the vision, the NIMC will be integral to maintaining the momentum necessary to translating the policy into reality and to holding those responsible to account. This can only be achieved in the context of the overarching commitments in the program for government to improve mental health policy and services. Implementation will also be progressed through planned additional investment from the sector under annual budgets and agreed of HSE annual service plan. It is of the utmost importance that the implementation of share and division be a collaborative process. And as Professor Fearon just said, it will be chaired um, by John Saunders. I intend that the NIMC and its subcommittees be fully representative, including strong service user, family members, service providers, and non-statutory sector participation. Just an update in relation to the mental health legislation, work to review the Mental Health Act 2001 is ongoing and nearing completion. The department has drafted a heads of bill to significantly amend and update the legislation, taking into account the 165 recommendations of the 2015 report of the expert group review. This process has been informed by a public consultation, a comprehensive submission by the Mental Health Commission and by Ireland's domestic and international commitments such as the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act 2015 and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I was pleased to secure significant additional funding of 50 million for mental health in budget 2021, thus bringing overall provision for next year to 1.076 billion. This reflects the government's continued commitment to mental health and we intend to seek further new investment over future years as overall exchequer resources allow. As is normal at this time of the year, the Department of Health and the HSE are intensively engaged in finalising the HSE service plan for next year. This will be published in the near future, and I will ensure this reflects a balance of prioritised new developments for mental health across all age groups, ranging from mental health promotion and early intervention to acute and forensic inpatient care. I would also ensure that greater attention is given to improved integration between mental health and other services whether it be addiction, primary care, or disability, or to those external to the health system, such as the educational or judicial sectors. In this context, I welcome the recently published final report of the Council of Europe Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Inhumane or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. The Department of Health and the HSE, in conjunction with the Department of Justice, will give full and proper consideration to the findings of this report. The CPT has acknowledged good progress in many respects since its previous visit in 2014, including positive interactions between people de detained and healthcare staff. However, there are acknowledged capacity issues in our system and they will be improved to some extent by the opening of the new National Forensic Mental Health Facility in Portran early next year. This significant and indeed historic move will replace the Central Mental Hospital in Dundrum. I recently visited both facilities and to see the impressive new complex and it is comparable to any similar modern service internationally. The new 170 bed campus, which will open on a phase basis, holds immense opportunities to address evolving service pressures. I, in collaboration with Minister McEntee, are in the process of establishing the new task force envisaged under the programme for government to look at improving links between healthcare and judicial systems. In particular, your contribution and cooperation has been considerable during our national pandemic. St. Patrick's has been and will continue to be to the fore of Irish and international mental health care. I understand that the first line of the original 1746 charter for St. Patrick's reads, George II, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France and Ireland, King, defender of the faith and so forth. We may have left poor old King George behind and even from the perspective of the time La Belle France, but we still thankfully have St. Patrick's. I congratulate you on celebrating your Founders Day, coinciding with the birth of Jonathan Swift. He was obviously a person of some insight, given his legacy, which is stronger today than ever. I wish you all the very best in the future, and I look forward to working together with St. Patrick's to help shape the future of mental health care in Ireland. Gorv Mahagut. 
Gur Magat, Minister. Thank you for that, Minister. And we really appreciate your time, as Paul mentioned at the outset, at an incredibly busy time for you and your colleagues. OK, we are now set to hear from our first set of speakers as we explore this question of what are the key features of an excellent mental health service. But as part of exploring that question, we obviously want to hear from you too. Your input is also really valid today, so invaluable. So please share your thoughts with the in the little Q&A box, and we'll hope to share those throughout and also at the end in discussion. So without further ado, first up in this session of speakers is Paul Gilligan, CEO of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. Um, good morning, Jan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister and indeed all the speakers for their attendance here today. And I would like to thank the Minister for uh, a really good uh, uh, opening. Um, I think it gives us all hope and uh, it's great to have a Minister that's so engaged in making the changes that are necessary. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the immense work put into the event by Paul Fearon, Tamara Nolan and the con communications team. And of course, I'd like to thank Jan, who has always been a great supporter of St. Pat's and again, for once again, giving us her time and support today. Um, this event is one of the most important that St. Patrick's Mental Health Services runs. And this year, with the publication of the new Sharing the Vision policy, a new programme for government, and of course, the pandemic, uh, the team is really important. Um, I welcome this opportunity to outline St. Patrick's Mental Health Services position and what we believe are the key cornerstones of an excellent mental health service. An excellent mental health service would ensure equitable access for all citizens. The right to good mental health care would be enshrined in legislation. The six cornerstones of such a service are in our view, first and foremost, it provides the highest quality care. It's grounded in human rights, based on a recovery model and is person centered. It measures outcomes, outcomes relating to clinical care, clinical governance processes, clinical programs, service user experience to understand what it does well and what it needs to do to continue to improve. It invests in research and innovation, enhancing evidence-based knowledge and developing new technologies and treatments that are efficient and cost-effective. It invests in attracting and retaining the best staff and is committed to developing the competencies of individuals and organizations. It identifies challenges in recruiting, and retaining staff in mental health services, and takes steps to address this shortfall. There, there's a in other words, there's a staffing strategy in place. It promotes mentally healthy living, and mental health awareness, and strives to reduce stigma in the community. It works in partnership with service users to plan, manage, and evaluate the services it provides, and it affords service user participation because it understands that full involvement has been associated with positive clinical outcomes, improved self-empowerment and enhanced recovery. Lastly, it's value driven. So there's a value driven financial structure in place to ensure the best outcomes are delivered for service users in the most cost effective way. An excellent mental health service doesn't compromise on any of these cornerstones. Um, St. Patrick's Mental Health Services believes that technology is now a critical enabler of mental health care delivery, as has been demonstrated throughout the pandemic. Like other organisations, um, and, and the Minister has acknowledged uh, what St. Patrick's has done indeed, what the HSE has done, technology has played a critical role in supporting us here at St. Patrick's to provide continuity of care throughout the pandemic. It facilitated remote access to inpatient care through our new home care and extended therapeutic leave, uh, services uh, both to adults and adolescents, uh, day services, day programs and indeed clinic appointments. A key component of the success of this was having implemented an electronic mental health record two years ago and I think that's really a challenge for us all now is to try and get a common uh, electronic mental health record in place in mental health care services. Um, indeed mental health services around the world have adopted the same approach. Of course, there are positive and negative implications of all this. Positive outcomes include increased accessibility and indeed where child and adolescent services have been concerned, we've gotten incredible feedback from families saying that their loved one has gotten the care they want and yet they didn't have to come into and, and sleep in a facility. Uh, with adults, we've gotten the same type of feedback. Um, using technology has absolutely increased our ability to collaborate 
It has increased the sharing of resources. Indeed, it's increased the sharing of knowledge. Um, and I think that this conference really reflects that concept of sharing and the importance of working together to meet the challenges. Of course, technology does present challenges. Um, we have to acknowledge the digital divide. Some service users are better positioned to access technology services than maybe many in the general population. But then, for example, older adults, it can be problematic. Uh, among some clinicians, there is a view that using digital means increases clinical risk. We need to assess and see if that is actually real. This year, we were faced with an unprecedented crisis, but our mental health service has for many years faced challenges. And the conversation comes back to funding. So I think we need to look at that. What is this sixth cornerstone? The value-driven financial structure is crucial. And what that means is we need to assess how cost-effective we are in the, in the context of uh, euros spent based on the outcomes. We need to look at outcomes. It isn't about the cheapest service, it's about the most effective. How can all this be achieved in order to support the realization of the new mental health policy, uh, the new shared vision? That's the crucial question. Um, I'm really looking forward to today's um, conference. I think we have su superb speakers, all of them with fantastic insights. It will be great to be able to, to utilize all that information to really shape how we move forward from now. So I'd like to finish with just a few questions. First and foremost, I'd like people to consider, can home-based treatment become an alternative to inpatient treatment for some service users and their families? That would be a whole new frontier of service development. Secondly, should we establish centres of excellence, perhaps five centres of excellence, serving the entire country and providing the full range of care options supported by a vibrant, all-inclusive community and primary care system with access to helplines, voluntary services, etc.? Thirdly, by leveraging tele-mental health services, the voluntary and independent sectors, could we provide every part of the country with a fully manned community mental health team and the highest quality care? Lastly, by consolidating existing staff numbers, could we enable the provision of as many fully staffed, highest quality community and inpatient services as possible? This has been a really tough year, but there's an opportunity to capitalize on what we have learned and to create a world-class mental health service. We know that by consolidating a human rights-based, person-centered approach, empowering service users, researching and utilizing evidence-based best practice, working together and leveraging the best that technology can offer, we can give all those who need it the support and services they require, ensuring they get the opportunity to live a fulfilling and productive life. I think this is a worthy cause worth pursuing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Great to have a few questions swimming around in our minds as we listen to all the rest of the, uh, the speakers this morning. So our next speaker is John Farley, who is CEO of the Mental Health Commission. We just seem to be having a little bit of difficulty uh, getting John there. Or John, are you there? No, butter. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. It's a little. This is a little bit like the Eurovision. I'm kind of going. No John problem. calling. What are your? <laughs> you well, don't worry. Here. If I can get through this ten minutes without the dogs or the budgie or the postman interrupting, I'd be very happy. So I, I suppose I just wanted to say good morning. My name is John Farley. I'm the chief executive of the Mental Health Commission. The Commission is an independent statutory body with functions to foster and promote high standards of care and good practice in the delivery of mental health services and to ensure the best interests of those involuntarily detained. I'm really happy to speak to you today at the Founders Day conference. Um, I trained as a mental health nurse. I worked up the road in St. James's and I actually won a few GAA medals playing with a team formed from staff in both St. James's and St. Patrick's. So I know um, a lot of people uh, who worked in St. Patrick's. Indeed, my mother also worked for many years in St. Pat's. Um, and what I learned from my mother is decency, compassion, professionalism. Um, although I have an abiding memory of her continually coming home with boxes of chocolates that she received from the many patients 
who she helped over the years. And just to say also, she also worked up in the unit in St. James's and, and she told me very early on in life that, um, you know, depending on what service you go to, uh, depending where you sit in the, in the social status, you can do um, much better and receive, you know, much better services. Um, so I, I really want to talk firstly about COVID-19. I want to take a moment to speak to you about it. And I want to formally and publicly acknowledge on behalf of the Mental Health Commission, the work of staff and management in our mental health services, whose actions have helped people stay well and stay and stay alive. Indeed, you know, I've spoken to the CEO and the medical director of St. Pat's at the very start of the uh, pandemic. And people must realize and understand that it was not an easy job. People were really caught on the hop. And um, I really do admire the work that happened. I think history would show that mental health services staff did a good job during the pandemic. Sadly, I also want to recognize the grief and suffering of families and staff where residents died. I want to acknowledge that over 2,036 people now have passed away across Ireland because of COVID-19. And I just want to recognize that for a minute. That includes staff, past service users, all the people you know, who, you know, ordinary people who've committed to making mental health services better and have committed to making Ireland better. Um, and I really think that's worth uh, understanding. Um, I believe we should use this experience to motivate us to modernize and improve our mental health services. I suppose I want to talk a little bit about transparency if we're speaking about the future. Um, I believe shining a light on reality is a key enabler of change. Transparency and light are healthy and create pathways of hope and healing. It is in the shadows, in the silence of darkness that despair thrives. Transparency lifts the veil, be that in corporate, clinical or community life. Sorry. It ensures we see reality, be that good, bad or indifferent. And once we see reality, we can then choose a pathway to change. Indeed, your founder and many like-minded reforming people since then shone a light on reality through their writings and their advocacy. The Commission creates transparency by continually inspecting and publishing reports which set out how services are operating. Many people receive good care. Indeed, St. Patrick's year in and year out and Edmundsbury has proven what good care is. However, many others are exposed to weak, ineffectual and outdated systems. People with severe mental illness, some people with severe mental illness are denied access to essential physical health care or admitted to centres found to be dirty and not well maintained. We often congratulate ourselves for closing the old institutions. However, for some people, we have just replaced one institution with another. At first, to nursing homes for our older patients, and many people might remember that. And nowadays, to prisons for some of our younger and more marginalised groups. It is also evident that many people continue to fall through the cracks into addiction and chronic homelessness. I, suppose I want to be clear, Ireland is no longer stuck in the psychiatric dark ages. We have improved our services. However, we are still on the journey to enlightenment. We are beginning to move on from a coercive paternalistic model. However, we're not there and we need more investment to create holistic systems based on interpersonal relationships. Mental Health Commission reports have, really, have revealed a 57% increase in episodes of physical restraint over the past 10 years. I suppose I want to be very clear, and we need to be clear, that seclusion and restraint are not therapeutic. Speaking personally, I often wonder how over the course of history, restraint and seclusion somehow transferred from being the tool of the jailer to a medical intervention implemented by healthcare professionals. No doubt, and people have argued to me this to me, it is required at times, but it should not be seen as a normal or regular practice. I would say rather than this, if a person is deprived of their liberty for mental health reasons, we should have in place proper premises, proper staffing, and an approach to enable recovery without over-prescribing seclusion and restraint. So I want to be very clear about that. If we are depriving people of their liberty, just because they are unwell and they have a mental health issue, we need to make sure we have the staff, 
premises and approach in place so that we don't need to use an overprescribed seclusion and restraint. And I don't think anyone can honestly say where this happens a lot that we have those systems in place. We now know that long stays in hospitals never created or never treated mental illness. Rather, it made illness chronic and demoralized people through institutionalization. I speak from my own um, experience there. I worked when I trained, I trained in the last of the big institutions. Yet, uh, this was probably better than the poverty people faced when institutions were first built. And we shouldn't forget about that. Um, people who are struggling, people who are socially deprived, particularly when the first institutions were brought into place. Um, it was poverty um, that drove many people into the institutions. Yes, without these large institutions, we are still condemning young people to chronic illness, purely because we have not put adequate rehabilitation services in place. Just like cardiac, cancer and stroke care, we need to invest in excellence and normalise rehabilitation. An institutional mindset is sticky. It holds on to patients with a diagnosed mental illness. Yes, it's not designed to respond to people who are on the edge of the system. Access is a key issue for all our health services. Many people with common disabling problems such as stress, depression, anxiety, and trauma have few options available through the public system other than a brief GP visit and medication. More critically, young people developing a serious mental illness are not being helped early enough. By failing to provide support early to younger people, we are losing opportunities to improve their life quality and longevity. COVID-19 is forcing services to meet people through home care. I just want to, I think we need to ensure this care is of the highest order and to my mind it should be regulated to ensure basic safety and quality. I really do believe in this point. You know we very quickly move from what we know is scrutinized safe and of a quality um, to, to new ways of doing things, but we have to make sure that's right. Ireland has come a long way in the last 50 years. In 1967, a commission of inquiry recommended radical and widespread changes that involved community services. While planning for the future, and I speak again from experience, I was in the system at that stage in 84, stated that services should be located in the community. In 2006, a vision for change moved things on again. And our new refresh sharing the vision restates uh, this need. Yes, the cold hard fact is we are still waiting for the standardized national community model to come to pass. And in fact, many of the people listening today and me and my staff, we are the people who will create this model. We are the people who will deliver this for the people of Ireland. I firmly believe, and if there was one message I could get across today from my experience is, creating a proper evidence-based integrated community mental health care system must be the primary goal of our generation. We have the foundations in place. Each generation has played its part as we slowly change. Sometimes, I know it seems like Sisyphus forced to roll the rock up the hill again and again, and as we get there, it rolls back down. But, you know, I, do, I genuinely think we are improving slowly and that this generation has the potential to be pushing the last rock up the hill. I mean, I also want to say to people, it is the only area of acute care that's properly regulated in Ireland. We shine a light and a strong light and we scrutinize acute mental health care. And very often in seeing that people can think um, it's not a perfect system and they can see the chinks, but that's transparency. And I want to be clear to people, um, that's a good thing. And I always want people to bear in mind, as we're finding these issues, it is to improve life and it is to show their reality. And I'm very conscious these realities and these lights are not shown in other areas of acute care. And that's why you see a lot more scandals, for example, in these areas. In mental health, we have honesty. We have an honest amount of people um, who are trying to do a good job and regulation is part of that. That said, we need to clear away the traces of outdated institutional care and really set out to implement a holistic community approach. A service with people at the centre, responsive to different ages, backgrounds and perspectives, centred on community-based support and local hubs, using a mix of peer cultural support and very importantly, clinical workforces. 
people underestimate this. Very often people get mixed up between mental health, mental illness, psychiatry. You know, psychiatry and mental illness aren't a good soundbite and they don't work well, you know, on social media platforms. But I want to be very clear, what will really create a proper mental health service is excellence in psychiatry and in the professionalism of the various multidisciplinary and um, mental health workers. We also need to provide support for people in crisis, a comprehensive harm min minimization approach to alcohol and drugs, more community-based addiction services to help people recover, and a broader range of therapies for inpatients. This is absolutely important. Medications are important. I've seen this time and time again. I've seen people struggling on the edge when they finally accepted their medication and uh, they got well, but this is only, medication is only part of the solution. To modernize, we must become holistic and we must be integrated. I suppose the focused implementation of sharing the vision will enable this to occur. However, I am conscious that in Ireland, the implementation of health strategy has proven weak with a clear inability to turn paper-based policy into a reality on the ground. And I would respectfully suggest four steps to creating our modern service into the future. First, we must commit to implementing share in the vision within the lifetime of the next two governments. I was originally worried about the 10 years, but it is a generational change, but we must deliver it. Secondly, we must continue to support the reform of the HSE. This is a must. We have to create a governance structure which ensures policy is rolled out in a coordinated way throughout the entire country. We have to stop these postcode lotteries. We have to develop our models, but we have to roll them out. Thirdly, we must press ahead with the repeal and replacement of the current Mental Health Act to reflect the human rights approach and to regulate community mental health services. Finally, funding for mental health services must be increased and ring-fenced. All the evidence points to the need for parity of esteem with the physical health care system. If we are to implement the policy, we will need a lot more clinical staff and a lot more teams in our community. Parity of esteem for me refers also to broader professional recognition of mental health care as an advanced specialist clinical practice. This is something as a regulator I've noticed. It doesn't seem to be recognized. Um, I've regulated in disability and in older persons care. Mental health care, um, if you look at the professions and the people listening here and indeed who work in St. Pat's, that is an advanced specialist clinical practice and it needs to be recognized as that. We have to create structures to define and enhance scopes of practice. The mental health team often contains many different uh, professions. And I suppose I just wanna say, it's also hard for service users to understand what each professional does. Um, and very often we can have inter, you know, uh, you, you'll hear often a voice of one profession advocating for that profession. And I absolutely understand that, but I would urge all professions to come together to enhance inter and multidisciplinary research and practice so that care develops along excellence, human rights and evidence-based lines. It is also critical that the state has clear oversight and scrutinizes services closely to ensure that they spend the money allocated to implement government policy. You know, over 1 billion being allocated now into mental health, we know it's not enough, but I would like to know exactly what it's being spent on and to ensure that it is all spent to deliver on this policy. Quality tells us if we build good structures and processes that good outcomes will follow. I briefly want to mention e-mental health. Um, and again, a word of caution. I believe this has the potential to achieve clinical and cost-effective ways to reach large numbers of people. I do believe it should be evidence-based and clinically evidence-based. Um, some commentators suggest that e-mental health has the potential to be a game changer in this field. Um, I think it's very early to be saying that. Uh, systematic reviews so far have found some evidence of efficacy although also point to limitations in the methodologies of many of the reviewed studies that people reference. Overall, the indications are that well-developed applications can have considerable efficacy, so it can be good, um, as good as traditional approaches, when appropriately provided and in an appropriate delivery environment by the right people. So we need to ensure that e-mental health is evidence-based, safe and effective, avoiding services that are not clinically validated 
regulated are provided by appropriately qualified mental health professionals. Because don't forget, the public get confused. The public don't necessarily understand what uh, a regulated service is and what a proper qualified mental health professional is. So in conclusion, this generation has the opportunity to implement person-centered, holistic mental health services. I welcome that the core principles which form the basis for a vision for change remain a central plank of government policy. I suppose, imagine an Ireland with adequate acute inpatient services for children, adults and older persons, with community mental health facilities that are open 24-7. An Ireland with mental health teams treating and supporting people in their community and homes, providing both crisis intervention and rehabilitation, thus avoiding unnecessary hospital admissions. That said, we do need to have uh, the acute hospitals there uh, within a, a high quality um, buildings and well staffed. I suppose I really want to emphasise, and I'm part of this, and indeed my staff and the commission who work so hard, all of us here today have a vested interest in this future. Over the course of the next 10 years, we will be joined by the next generation who are now in secondary school are currently studying to become healthcare professionals. And indeed the next generation of people who will become unwell. And indeed the next generation of families who are trying to help people in their families who become unwell. So there's a whole generation of people following us I firmly believe that the values of decency, compassion, and care that indeed motivated my mother and motivated most people in this system and myself, that these young men and women also have those values um, in joining our service. If tapped into, I firmly believe this can create a future that we can all be proud of. All of us today, like the people who came before us, are just laying foundations for a better future. I would urge all to stick to the task, keep learning and improving, and let's be the change that we want to see. Thank you. Thank you, John, and extra treats to the budgies and the dogs. They were all impeccably behaved during that. So we'll keep things moving so that we stay on track. And I'd like to introduce you now to Dr. William Flannery, who is the president of the College of Psychiatrists in Ireland. Welcome, uh, thank you. Um, and um, I have some slides if that's if that's all right with everybody. Uh, I just like, I suppose, unusually to begin and um, just to thank John for his talk and to say that the college um, really would support the principles that he is allowing, uh, has outlined there. And next time I might actually grab some of his slides. So, so my first slide is uh, is about the mission of the college, something I'm very proud of, which is to promote excellence in the practice of psychiatry. However, looking to the future, I do wonder where psychiatrists and particularly those who we treat, those with severe mental illness, where, where they will fit into that, into that future. And I hope the following slides will explain somewhat of, of my thinking. So next slide, please. So this slide, I just want to introduce the college. It was the college was established in 2009, or what I should say is that we got independence from, from the Royal College in, in London, is, and it's the sole professional body for psychiatrists in, in, in Ireland. Um, the core of what we do is training, and that's what I want to emphasize today, because what will influence the future, like as John said, the, uh, the young people, so, how they are trained, the quality of their training, and how many we train uh, to, be, to be fully specialized psychiatrists will influence the future. A little bit more about the college. The college structure is based on faculties. I listed the first four because these are specific categories of specialism in the medical council. The next, the next number are, um, uh, I think, are useful for reference because these are sources of uh, expert opinion or expertise. We have a number of committees and one I would like to, in particular to mention is the Refocus Committee. That is our forum for carers and users of services, in other words patients, the chair of whom sits on council and um, is 
the refocus has is has been most useful from the college from the point of view of training and it has also been the one aspect of the college that has influenced the HSE the most as the HSE mental health engagement and recovery colleges have actually stemmed from the work that refocus have done so next slide please this diagram then is the training pathway as you can see, it's actually quite long. It takes about seven years to be um, a specialist in psychiatry. You have to have a, attend a medical school and have done an intern year to be eligible for recruitment. It's divided, training is divided into two stages, BST with the first year termed uh, foundation year. So that takes four years. During that time, you will sit the, the college professional exams and Training is also through what, what we call learning outcomes and continuous assessment. And the college also offers an annual review of progress. So after BST, you move on to HST, which has a time period of three years. Once that is completed, you're eligible to be placed on the specialist register of the Medical Council. So training is delivered through nine deaneries which are attached to the, to the various universities. And in each deanery, there's um, deans, tutors, and mentors. Uh, the college accredits each deanery and this, this process is, is underway. And the college itself is accredited for training by the Medical Council and by other uh, international um, uh, relevant and appropriate bodies. So next slide, please. So, I suppose, are we wanted or what is the need? Um, so on one side, it's more relevant for psychiatrists and the other side is more relevant for the patient experience. So, um, so not all consultants are actually specialists. A consultant is a contractual term. So it's what, what's in the contract. So, it's ex so the expectation is that specialists are appointed to that, but due, due to pressures of service demand, availability of staff, that is not always the case. So that can be a subtlety that is missed, particularly by those that use the service. Um, currently, there's about under 600 psychiatrists working across healthcare in, in sort of a number where there's public, private or voluntary sector is, and the college estimate in 10 years time, we'll need roughly more than 800 or about 840, 50 as uh, psychiatrists um, at that time. Then as for junior psychiatrists, Again, similar to consultants, not all junior psychiatrists are a trainee. So although more than half are part of our formal training program, up to 250 are actually non-training. Uh, now this is much the same for other medical specialities. However, it's in marked contrast to the international experience where typically it's less than 10% of junior doctors are actually non-training. So in other words, as we all know, there's an overlines both in psychiatry, but also across the health system on non-specialist, non-training junior doctors. Then recruitment and retention is, the college is, is allowed to recruit 60, about 60 trainees a year. And I'm delighted to say that our training tops your training counts, which is the annual medical council survey of trainee experience. What does not do as well across all medical specialties is the trainee experience of the workplace environment. And this is similar to what, what any patient has, has experienced on a trolley in a busy ED department. It's not pleasant. And it's also not pleasant for those working in that environment as well. Uh, we get roughly about 4% um, of the number of medical graduates uh, leaving, uh, leaving, uh, leaving colleges in Ireland enter psychiatry. What I mean is that 4% of the total number, but in fact, about half of those are actually uh, doctors who've trained abroad. Um, so the 4% is, is typical, so, so that's good for us because that's what the international average is. But if we feel we need more psychiatrists, is, it will be a, a struggle to go above that 4% as that appears to be the ceiling elsewhere. And then it is, as I said, 50% of our trainees, roughly 50 are from, are from uh, non-Irish um, medical schools. So by definition, they're relatively footloose. 
and open to the international market. So recruitment and retention of those into the future will be will be interesting. And certainly, I think one of the challenges for the HSE will be uh, the recruitment the recruitment process. In in that, if we are able to train more, is how are they actually placed or recruited into the system? Then, from the patient point of view, is essentially pay for what you get. Is the college fields the to to have adequate and appropriate mental health services? You, you need about two billion. We get, um, or the health service gets about one billion. So if that's what we want, but that's fine. But bear in mind that is what you will get. So as John referred to, is so sort of parity of esteem, the parity of esteem, and what what I mean by that is that there is the same level of access to services as there is for physical health care, and those with um, severe mental illness have good and appropriate access to physical health care as well as it is physical illness that actually kills them in the end. I'll mention is Penrose's Law. This has been well known since, since the 30s. Um, I actually would like to refer to Professor Kelly's paper, um, although I forgot to put in the reference, is which looks at that in the Irish context and in general as the number of psychiatric beds are are reduced. The number of the numbers in prison go up, and I think the minister, what the minister referred to, is a very nice example of that. And that was the European torture watchdog commenting on the difficult circumstances that prisoners with mental illness face right now in Irish prisons, and it hit some of the papers during the week. Um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Dr. Feeney, did a very interesting paper looking at the experiences of community mental health teams um, and the pattern referrals over the past 30 years. Now, the majority of my colleagues work in community mental health teams. So there's been a radical change or a radical increase. In other words, a 20 fold increase over that period. So it's not that uh, severe mental illness has massively increased. It's rather that there's a massive increased demand from what can be termed social and emotional crises. Um, I think it's important to note that that there is that demand out there, but whether you but where that demand goes, whether it's a, whether it's correct or appropriate for it to go to a community mental health team, and then how that possibly then crowds out. Um, uh, the resources available for services that are designed for those with more psychotic type illnesses. Then the college's experiences, unfortunately, in the last number of years from the Department of Health point of view, is that um, we're possibly not seen as a key, key, key stakeholder. Uh, we've not been prominently involved in slaughter care, in sharing the vision, or indeed uh, more recently in the review of the Mental Health Act. So, so I think that's somewhat dis, 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 uh, disappointing for us. And um, I will see how that evolves into the future. So my next slide, please. Now this is, it's uh, meant to be a very dramatic slide and to emphasize possibly the, the most serious point I would like to make today, that if you have serious, um, severe mental illness, your life expectancy is 20 years less than that of the rest of the population. That, that is very disappointing. And we, we know that from international studies, looking at over the past number of decades, that there has been a decline in the standardized mortality rates for those with, with severe mental illness. Now, we do not have relevant similar data for Ireland because the case register data needed to produce this evidence is actually not in existence. And what these people die from is from cardiorespiratory diseases and cancer. So it's 20, up to 20, 20 years. So, so a, as I said, a very disappointing figure, despite the services that, had, that have, been, have been in place for, for the past 20, 30 or more years. Next slide, please. So we're getting towards the end here, possibly. And um, 
So I think, you know, reflecting on where we are now, developments, and indeed into the future, uh, another plug for the college is our Irish Journal of Psychological Medicine. Again, this is something I'm very proud of. It's indexed, so it's on PubMed. Um, so it's a high quality scientific uh, journal. And uh, I would hope that it would continue to be used to develop the evidence base for Ireland and for the Irish setting. So that's a very important resource for looking into the future if we want to do what, 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 what we want to say. The Medical Council, just as the current initiative, is looking at shared care. So, so this gives the ethical and regulatory framework for treating those with who are treating patients who, who are complex and multiple morbidities by a number of specialists. So, so, so that model, in other words, the ethics and regulation going in will be necessary for how, for how we treat and where we treat going into the future, particularly if you're looking at integrated care. Then the form of postgraduate training bodies is a form essentially of all the, um, all the medical uh, postgraduate bodies. Um, and, and they are, have started a national strategy, it's not for P, for post, I've left out the G for postgraduate medical training for the next 10 years. Um, so, so obviously that's looking to, 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 to the future. Some of the challenges there will be actually what's, what's mentioned. It's like what Paul referred to is the idea of five centers of excellence is one of the problems with training now, as we know, there's a lot of very small centers. Um, and to shift those will require um, a, a change in political perspective. And also as well, it's what has been noted is, well, where is the clinical voice within within um, the department and within within government itself is obviously there is one clinical voice which is very relevant at the moment but where are where is where is that path for the other medical disciplines and including my own discipline just like to mention the national clinic programs these have been established for for quite a while but it's a model the HSE lights and it is their innovative approach to specific service needs it tends to be a collaboration between the relevant medical college and the HSE itself. And the aim obviously being, being, being to improve care. And I think this is where the word transparency, which I would obviously strongly support is interesting because the funding arrangements for these are, I suppose, to be kind or are opaque. Um, so, so and, and to bear in mind that these are actually a very small part of the current budget for, for mental health services. Then looking to the future, the focus of the college is, is very much currently on, on training psychiatrists and a credit to those involved with the next piece of work, which, which um, was considerable and took place over the past two years and is nearing or indeed has completed. So that is workforce planning for psychiatry for the next 10 years into 2030. And the earlier figure I said around 800, as psychiatrists, there was general agreement that that is the number we need to be aiming for. So involved with that was ourselves, was National uh, uh, Doctor Training and Planning Unit, particularly led by Professor Frank Murray, the mental health services, so, so led by Dr. Amir Nazari, who will be speaking later on, and his business manager, Andrew Lynch, and a lot of work done by HSE, HR, that's Teresa Heller, so well done to them, and joined towards the end by David McGuire from the Department of Health. So a credit to them there, and I think that certainly from, from that point of view suggests that psychiatrists are indeed wanted and we're moving towards a number that certainly the college would, would, would support going into the future. Uh, I'm afraid to say that though from the, the college actually does not have, uh, we have a policy arm, but it's not enormously uh, well developed. So, so, so I hope to set up a group looking at what I've turned pathway for psychiatric, psychiatric services. And I would hope that in maybe in a year's time, if we, if, we, if we repeat this talk, I actually will have more to bring to this session. Then I suppose the last point I want to make is that um, really I feel that severe mental illness, that is schizophrenia, bipolar affective disorder, and major depression has to be at the core of any mental health service. 
So my last few remarks is to say that from the college point of view, I think we have a good training program. We have a well-recognized journal and the expertise to support any future um, uh, developments is, but though looking to that future, I do wonder where severe mental illness will fit into that, is that looking right now at the planning, policy, regulatory and legal direction, it would appear that severe mental illness is being possibly marginalised. Uh, however, though, I do welcome Minister Butler's comments. And in particular, what, uh, what she said is about sharing the, sharing the vision. I have to look at my own notes here, is that it does not replace but rather refines a vision for change. And this is something the college is very happy to, to engage with. Finally, I'd like to thank all my speakers and just to make the comment that actually I've met um, all of you over the past, past year. And I think we have a very good and productive uh, relationship. And I think that is very good for our services going into the future. So with that, thank you. And thank you, Paul, for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Flannery. We appreciate that and appreciate your time. OK, we'll keep moving. And our next speaker joining us is Fiona Coyle. And Fiona is the CEO of Mental Health Reform. Uh, uh, yeah, my name is Fiona Coyle. I'm the CEO of Mental Health Reform. Um, for those who are not familiar, Mental Health Reform is Ireland's uh, national commission for mental health. We are a membership organisation representing nearly 80 uh, members, predominantly from the community and voluntary sector, um, that represent a diversity of interest. Um, I'm delighted to, to be here today, and you know, I, I think I agree um, you know, with many of the comments that have been raised by the distinguished speakers um, that have come before me. Um, this week, um, I read an article which described mental health as a Cinderella issue. Excuse me, Fiona, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but you sound like you're joining us from another realm. Something has happened with your sound and it feels like you've been passed through some kind of space filter. So we have our next speaker, Dr. Mary Favier, available. So what I was going to ask you to do, would you mind logging off and reconnecting? And while you do that, we'll move on to Dr. Mary Favier. Is that all right with you? Thanks, Fiona. Talk to you shortly. So we we'll, thanks also to all of you for sending in your... Um, your questions, they're coming in thick and fast, which is great, and your comments. So now we'll join Dr. Mary Favier, who is immediate past president of the Irish College of General Practitioners and a member of the National Public Health Emergency Team. Okay, you're getting my screen share there? Yeah, perfect. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so thank you for that. I, I, I hope she can sort out her noise issues. They're, they're quite a challenge. So I'm Mary Favier. I'm a general practitioner in Cork in Farnry Fair Hill, which is a North City suburb. I am just stepped on as the president of the Irish College of GPs and I'm a COVID advisor to the college now and I sit on NEFET for, you know, as a, as a general practitioner. So I'm really delighted to, to speak here today, just you know, to, to make the case that general practice is a really important part of, of the mental health community. And the, my interest in mental health really, I think started back as a, as a medical student really, studying psychiatry. And I, was, I, was, I appeared to be one of the few people who found it fascinating and found it just so interesting. And, and I continue then into, um, I, did a, I did a volunteer stint as a counsellor in the Rape Crisis Centre as an NCHD for three years before the uh, counselling services were appropriately professionalised. And I just learned absolutely so much about psychotherapy and counselling. And it was an absolute credit to the volunteer therapists who, who did all the supervision and training there. And then uh, as I became a GP and worked you know, with a lot of mental health issues in general practice, I did a, a diploma in cognitive and behavioural therapy. And that just took me to a different part of, of mental health, much more in, very appropriate to general practice care and the type of work we do. Uh, for those of you who know the psychiatric services in Cork, the, in the old Our Lady's Hospital, the acute unit was called St. Anne's. And so there was a, a joke around our practice that I used to run St. Mary's because we were quite somewhat close by. Now it's somewhat ironic that the clinic has moved to the orthopedic to the St. Mary's unit there. But I have to say doing a CBT diploma very much improved my, my ability to manage my consultations and particularly the length of them. 
so just to put some context on, on general practice, uh, there are about 3,200 GPs, various numbers, depending on how you count, up to 3,500, and about 23 million consultations per year in general practice. This is the HSE number, the various numbers up to about 27 million, depending on how you count by the ESRI. And 95% of those consultations are conducted without onward referral to the, to the secondary care services. And it's a really important thing to know in just the sheer volume uh, uh, that we undertake in our routine work. Uh, generally face-to-face, -face, obviously a lot more uh, telephone work and remote work with COVID, but we're largely back to a substantial face-to-face -face, um, provision at the moment. And 30 to 40% of our general practice consultations uh, have a mental health component. So we start any consultation with a presumption that there will be a mental health part to it. And we do that from knowing who the patient is when you see their name in the schedule through to going into the waiting room to call them out, what they look like, how they stand up, you know, do they shuffle, do they limp, do they look you in the eye, how they sit, where they put their hands, do they look at the floor, how they start their, their presentation of, of their problem. And as, as so many of you know, of course, that mental health issues rarely present as I am depressed or I am anxious. They're so often intertwined into other consultations and other issues and other topics and very much are unraveled and unwoven. And they, first of all, obviously need to be acknowledged and unmasked. And that is what we do as general practitioners. And sometimes we'll see it, we'll know there's more there. And the person's hand will be on the door handle as they leave saying, well, I'm here doctor, or what do you think? Or sometimes you'll hear consultations about a family member that are a proxy for themselves. And many mental health problems, as, as you know, who are the experts in the area, you know, remain hidden for so long and only, only become apparent when an additional stressor appears. And, and that's a thing that we always need to be aware of. And that, mental health in a general practice setting. And we, as we know this, the life cycle of mental health you know, conditions is that it's a journey. They, they, they wax, they wane, they come, they go. They're very rarely fully solved and none of us are without them at some stage. And it's, it's a very important point in terms of our perspective that this is, is a journey. So you might ask, well, well, what do you GPs do? You know, the, 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 the stereotype, the pejorative stereotype is uh, sore throats all day. Uh, well, in my line, because I'm in practice where I am for 24 years, I actually very rarely see sore throats because so many of my patients are, are booked in advance in chronic care. But we listen, really. We probe, we explore, we check in, we, we ask. The training is all about those open-ended questions. And the, some of the most important thing we'll do is we will empathize and we will validate. And for many people with mental health issues and psychological challenges, doing that alone is often enough. And there is a soothing element that can be achieved just in, 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 in that part of the consultation. But then the, the most important thing we do as well as we encourage, we, we, we cajole people to, to take action. We give them advice all the time and we signpost. And I'll come back to this about the very important central role of GP as the hub to signposting out to the services, whether they services the patient accesses themselves or services that we then refer them on to. And whether they're online services, telephone services, in-person services, whether they're, they're supports, whether they're you know, you know, recovery, groups a, that is a very substantial part of our role and it's a really important thing for people who don't work in general practice and are in the in the allied services to to know that we we do need to know about the services and that don't ever feel you can't remind us and particularly for younger gps who mightn't have that, that depth of knowledge of all the various services that actually exist and of course, as you know, we work with our, our specialist colleagues in mental health who we couldn't do without. And I'm lucky in the area I'm in, we have a really good um, acute and long term psychiatry service. And, you know, so, for instance, during, during COVID, the home based crisis team, we, which is excellent in our area, really were fantastic and made made were very proactive. We also work with CAMS, obviously the adult and old age services. And I'll make no bounce about it. The, the, the trying to access the CAM service in our area is, while it's very good, is generally takes two years. And it, we have a real challenge with resources. And similarly into the community, we, we use a lot of community-based counseling in the primary care counseling services and community psychology. And again, just hugely under-resourced. And interestingly, I work in a better area than many. 
But one of the most important things we do in the area of mental health as GPs is we provide continuity of care. And that's because, for instance, in the practice I'm in, I'm there for 24 years. So I had a woman, for example, into me last week who was describing feeling somewhat low and anxious, and some of it was COVID related in her family. And the thing she said to me when we were discussing it and trying to establish how difficult it was and whether she, what we should do, was well, she said, well, of course, it's, it's nowhere near like I was 10 years ago. I mean, nothing like that. And this is a woman who had had a dreadfully difficult depressive illness 10 years ago and truly, to use that expression, had dragged herself up by her bootstraps over about two years. And what was really useful was for me as her GP who had been there at that time, I could reference immediately the severity and where, where she was placed on a spectrum. And she could judge that really well herself. And so, and as, as GPs, the, one of the most common com commentaries we hear and criticisms we hear about the, the, the psychiatric specialist services, and I'm not making a criticism here, it's just a comment, is this issue of continuity of care. They see a consultant on the first visit and then a sequence of other, usually NCHDs afterwards, obviously who don't know them and who, who may not even have the file or, or, or if they have, may not even have read the file. And as, as we know, and particularly you see this in, in when you're, you're looking after younger patients, only so many times people can tell their story. There's so many, so many times that a teenager will really communicate and engage and you can't squander them. And one of the most important roles we have in general practice is to maintain that continuity and that knowledge. And it's really important, even not just in the psychological support part of it, but in, in, in the more medicalized, particularly the prescribing service, how many patients have gone to a, a hospital service to be put on isocitalopram again or, or a pregabalin again, when we have documented side effects to that and of poor tolerance. And it's just to remember that we are the repositories of those types of knowledge bases into our software systems, because we're largely all, you know, computerized and just to make sure you tell us that because we can then put it back out to you in the next referral letter and of course nothing can can be said about health mental health in Ireland without an absolute understanding of the role of health inequalities and the social determinants of health and if you work in an area like I do of high urban deprivation where the majority 80 percent of patients have a medical card and those who don't are the working poor who can't afford health care I mean, it, it, the irony is not lost on me that I'm giving a talk to an institution, it's annual day that I generally can't refer to because my patients can't afford it. And that's not a criticism of St. Patrick's, it's the, it's the grossly poor underfunding of the health services. So I just want to take this opportunity to just discuss a little bit about the impact of, of COVID on mental health. And we, we know the impact, it's been huge, economic, social, occupational, cultural, and we know who it's impacted because we see these people and all of us in health know it. But as GPs at the coalface, it's, it's probably been one of the biggest markers of, of uh, the work we are doing in, in the COVID environment. And so many of our telephone calls, so many of our in-person consultations, even at the height of COVID, when you really are, are trying to keep patients out of the, the surgery to protect everybody, the patients we were seeing were those with the most significant mental health challenges, and so many of them related to COVID. And unfortunately, there was disruption of the services. Some coped much better than others and went into action, and others didn't and effectively disappeared. And I think what, no you know, apologies to the minister, but the, there were no additional supports that were real on the ground, and they didn't materialize or, or in the end, come to anything. So we know again who was most affected, younger people, those 19 to 24 year olds, uh, those who've lost the most, they've lost everything from an educational point of view, an economic point of view, a social point of view, uh, very vulnerable group. And then you go right through to the older age groups who those who've had to shelter at home, who have become quite anxious and panicky and people who have had particular health illnesses, but particularly you see as a GP, those both living um, alone or those away from home or in very dis dysfunctional home environments. And working from home has been an absolutely huge challenge. I mean, I, I had a patient into me a couple of weeks ago who 24 year old working for a call center, um, working from home in a, in a house share she'd only just got. She was in the box room. She was with two guys she hardly knew, perfectly nice guys, one working in the kitchen, one working in the, in the sitting room. She wasn't allowed to use any part of the house between nine and 5.30. So she, she basically existed in a box room 24 hours a day and, and knew nobody. And the impact on her 
mental health, particularly she, because she'd had previous anxiety issues. And, and we know from some of the surveys that the Irish COVID Psychological Survey have done very good work looking at, at that confirms these groups, which is what GPs report. And of course, then the other group is around children and the, the increasing vulnerability of children with, with anxiety and poor sleep routines and disrupt, disrupted sleep. And GPs were probably the biggest advocates of the return to school because that's what our patients were telling us. The, the parents of these children were struggling with them, their, their kids and their ability to manage them. And going back to school was an absolutely important thing. And one thing I just like to flag is, is the whole thing that GPs felt was that there was a, a move and a tendency in the, the community to go back to a framing that somehow medication or a, a drug was, was the answer in a crisis scenario that there could be some sort of a quick fix whether it was a return to an SSRI that was prescribed before or a friend had had before, or could I just have a relaxer or just a once off? Could I have sleeping tablets? Because again, these are difficult times. Initially, there was a, a, an absolute dearth of street drugs and we had, we had three patients who had withdrawal seizures. Uh, that we've now, it's gone back in completely. There's no supply chain problems now. They've all adapted obviously, but there's a very significant uplift in the amount of cannabis used and, and sitting on the couch, particularly for those, again, reflected in the population I work with who aren't working from home. They're all being furloughed on, on COVID payments because they're in the service industry. And then of course, we have the whole issue of the relationship of, uh, of us as a society to alcohol and the self-medicating with alcohol, which has, has been very substantial and will potentially have longer term sequelae. And I just want to make the point to, to, for us to remind ourselves about us and, and who we are and where we've been in the health services and to, to, to mind our own mental health. Because I think, the type of, of healthcare workers that I have in my practice are largely home care assistants. They, they work as home helps, they're nursing assistants, they're nurses, they work in long-term residential care facilities. Uh, they have been under untold pressure. They have picked up every bit of slack in terms of, of, of extra hours and coverage and patient care, and, and they're worn out. And the, the, so there's only so much resilience that can go around. And I, you just have to be really careful if you're telling people to do, to do some more mindfulness, take a Pilates course at lunchtime. And increasingly, I, we feel, and general practitioners report this, that healthcare workers increasingly feel taken for granted. And they fear for the future. And they have a sense of dread and a slight impending doom on what's coming yet. And unfortunately, inevitably, we will have a third wave. And it's, it's when that comes. And I would absolutely hope with the lifting of restrictions next week, that it won't be over the Christmas period at the one time when people who are exhausted need a break and need to have an expectation of a break and that we haven't to look at increased staffing levels over the hospital, over the, uh, the holiday time. Uh, because otherwise, I mean, with a bit of luck, it'll be more into, German, into January and into February. So the other thing, of course, that COVID has unmasked is, is a very poorly resourced occupational health service, really, really poor, um, either doesn't exist uh, for most health workers or, or it is under-resourced or, or it is of limited value. And this is just a promo for something the college is, the Doctors for Doctors program. We, we have started where awareness that every, every healthcare worker should have a GP and they don't always find GPs. It started for GPs to find a GP, but now we've, we've, we've moved it out to all healthcare workers. If you need to find a GP, this program is in the Irish College of GPs. And to give a shout out to the wider services that support this program, in the psychology and psychiatry support services. And I know St. Patrick's provides some of them. It, it's a big thank you. It's a very successful service. So just, my last slide really, just to look at the future. I think the most important thing I think we need to see is that we have a coordination of services in mental health and particularly that they are coordinated through general practice. We are those who provide the, the continuity of care, the longevity of care. We can be taken for granted that we're always there and as we should be. And we should try to look at a hub and spoke approach that, that centers the patient in their community in a primary care setting, not necessarily in a general practice surgery, but, but in that environment. And of course, to do this, we have to provide protected time for GPs. There is absolutely no funding stream around mental health in our general medical contracts. And it has to reflect the workload. And we have to, to root it you know, such that the services are, lo are local and nearby. 
and it's about team working and we'd, we'd like to be invited to join the teams. We'd like to be able to cooperate with our mental health colleagues who do the most fantastic job to, to be part of the framing. And it's like, we'd like a say in, in mental health policy and, and how Slauncher Care is rolled out as, as the College of Psychiatry have just noted. And so it's to make sure that all those voices get heard. And that we keep in mind that it is a whole society approach to mental health and that we must both pr promote it and protect it. And that, you know, to, to quote that much maligned phrase, we are all in it together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Favier. And just to let you know while we have you here, we've had some comments in to thank you for your contribution to Neffet and, you know, so say all of us. And I'm struck when you're talking about the self-care of medical healthcare professionals. I hope you're finding some time for some self-care because I'm pretty sure you've had a, a hectic year so far. We'll have you back in the next few minutes for some questions. For now, we're going to try and return to Fiona Coyle to see what her um, sound is like and fingers crossed. The uh, tech gods, such as they are, will be shining on us. <laughs> Jan, am I am I back okay. to Donegal hey. Lilt instead of yes. Darth Vader? Okay. Your lovely Donegal Lilt, no Darth Vader in sight. On you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. And apologies um, around um, the, the sound quality uh, during the first attempt. So, yeah, um, just to, to start again, just to say, Moji Moi Vivalik, um, and thank you for the opportunity um, to be here. Um, so Mental Health Reform is Ireland's um, national coalition on mental health. We're a membership organisation representing 80 organisations, um, up to 80 organisations who come together under our umbrella really to drive for the progressive reform of our mental health services and supports. Um, yeah, so this week, you know, I was reading an article which described mental health as a Cinderella issue. And I think often in the media, you know, in Ireland and, and globally, we see this term used to describe an overworked, neglected, underfunded mental health service. What, what is often forgotten is that, you know, the central messages, the messages, you know, we, we teach kids in the Cinderella story is not to stop believing, not to let setbacks get in our way and to take our opportunities. And COVID-19 offers us an opportunity to rethink your approach and to really drive those structural changes that are needed um, to put services in place for, for people around the country. I think it's always important to remind yourselves, you know, in these spaces and forums that the right to mental health, it's a fundamental human right and should be available for all without distinction of gender, race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. And our mental health system needs to be guided by this, which explicitly recognizes valuing the input of each person on what they believe is their own highest attainable standard. It's very personally defined. Like many on this call before me, um, mental health reform has welcomed the publication of Sharing the Vision. You know, this opens a new chapter for Ireland's mental health system. The policy sets out a progressive framework for delivering better mental health services. If properly resourced and delivered, this policy can have a transformative impact on our mental health system meaning people can get the access to the support they need in their community to achieve their best possible mental health. I think, you know, I, I'm full of opportunity. I think that never in the history of the state um, that mental health aspect of a public health crisis has been so prominent. I think, you know, to, to echo what others have said, you know, with the new policy, with you know, the, the awful situation we find ourselves in, and I'm not, you know, in any way neglecting what that, this pandemic has done to us, to our communities, to our society, but we do perhaps have what may be a once in a generation opportunity to build a system, a mental health system that gives parity to mental health and operates in a coherent and integrated way. So what needs to happen? So I'm going to kind of go through five 
points, some of which have, have been repeated and I'm glad to hear others say them as well. Firstly, it's about leadership and political prioritization. We need political stewardship and prioritization like never before. Um, what you know we've been welcoming as mental health reform is that you know we've been noting that mental health has been a key policy consideration in recent times, often noted by our Tisha, by our Tanishter. But this needs to be followed by action. We also note, you know, that there's a public mandate being given to our politicians around mental health. Mental health has never, as I keep saying, it's been so dominant in public discourses. And, you know, it's, it's easy perhaps for us in sometimes these echo chambers to say that and to believe that, but there's some studies that show that as well. So RTE commissioned um, a major piece of research um, called The Next Normal to better understand the experiences, views and attitudes of people living in Ireland during the pandemic. And mental health came forth as the most important issue facing Ireland at the moment after you know, COVID, the economy and our general health service. Now, this was actually considered a major survey outcome as mental health had never previously featured as high on any kind of comparable survey. But, you know, it must remain a key issue for government and be at the heart of all COVID-19 recovery planning. We also need leadership at the delivery level. I think, you know, something we've been calling for and a lot of this call have kind of echoed is the re-establishment of a, a dedicated lead for mental health within the HSC that reports directly to the CEO. This is such an important decision, uh, position. You know, we're really committed to driving the type of change that we all agree needs to happen. We need to ha have that leadership within the HSC. Secondly, accountability and oversight. This was kind of flagged as perhaps one of the, the, key, um, the key challenges to the, to the lack of, of full implementation of vision for change. And you know, our new policy, it, it has a very clear implementation plan who that kind of outlines, you know, who does what when. Um, and we, we really need to ensure that that accountability um, and oversight is there to ensure implementation happens. And we need to ensure, you know, that we're really addressing those difficult structural issues. You know, at, it's sometimes easy maybe to, to implement, you know, the low hanging fruit, the, the quick wins, which, you know, are really important for building momentum, but that can't be um, at, um, at the kind of, the, the disadvantage of, kind of overlooking some of the more difficult structural changes that needs to happen. You know, going back to that leadership, to that prioritization, that's so important. The National Implementation and Monitoring Committee, um, which we welcome the announcement uh, of, and it's going to be chaired by our colleague, John Saunders, offers a great opportunity as well to ensure this accountability and oversight. And as mental health reform, we're eager to see this driven forward and are excited to be able to support it in any way we can. Thirdly, funding. It's come up, I think, in nearly everyone's presentation to date. You know, we need more funding. Ireland's national health, mental health budget currently stands at over 1 billion. The WHO recommends that mental health spending should be 12% of overall healthcare budget. Slanche Care recommends 10%. However, in 2020, our budget was approximately 6% of overall health budget. While more investment is needed, we also need to make wise investment. We need clear accountability and transparency in funding that's clearly linked to better outcomes for people. I think it's been mentioned um, by a number of speakers as well, but you know, it's back to, to our systems and, you know, our IT systems in particular is something I'd like to highlight. The development of an appropriate electronic mental health information system based on key performance indicators 
will assist in driving transparency and accountability in the development and delivery of mental health services. This is not new. This was envisioned for change 14 years ago. And, you know, it's not acceptable that 14 years later, we've no national information system to accurately account for performance and mental health expenditure. This is something that needs to be addressed. My fourth point, we need an effective cross-departmental and interagency response. We all know we don't all have an equal opportunity to flourish in this life. We all have mental health and we can all experience mental health difficulties, whatever our background or our walk of life. But the risks of mental health difficulties are not equally distributed. I welcome um, the Dr. Mary Favier before me, who, who, who reminded us um, that COVID um, has relentlessly reminded us that mental health is so strongly affected by a range of social detriments, including you know, how we live, work, our age, isolation, unemployment, stigma, discrimination. So, you know, mental health, it's not solely the concern of the health sector, but requires action across a range of social and economic domains. This is a much needed step change. And again, it goes back to political leadership um, accountability, prioritization, and funding. All these points are so interconnected. The fifth point I want to make, and it's, it's a very important one, we need to work towards a mental health service that is truly human rights and recovery orientated. These are two of the four principles that are going to guide, you know, the delivery of our new policy. But it's very difficult to go from principles and language to a change in culture on how we deliver our services. Our keynote speaker later today um, is a former UN Special Rapporteur on, um, on the right, um, is a former UN Special Rapporteur and he has spoken in the past on the right of everyone to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health and recognizes, and I hope he doesn't mind that I am quoting him, that the recovery approach, which when implemented in conformity with human rights, has helped break down the traditional power um, dynamics, it empowers individual, making them agents of change rather than passive recipients of care. While there's been much progress over the last decades, I believe we, we still have a long way to go to really truly embed a recovery oriented ethos into our mental health services. Mental health reform has consistently highlighted that people with experiences of mental health difficulty as a group are one of the least protected in terms of their rights. I was really heartened to hear the minister state that the, the heads of bill have been drafted to, um, to update our Mental Health Act. The expert group on the review of the Mental Health Act um, begun their work eight years ago, and they recommended a shift from the Act's guiding principle of best interest to a human rights-based approach focused on the principles of autonomy, choice, and respecting the will and preferences of the person. There's no doubt that there's a requirement for a coherent legal and policy framework to ensure the effective implementations of the principles of human rights, autonomy, and self-determination. As a matter of urgency, I really want to, you know, to call on the minister to publish that bill. You know, it's, it's a crucial part of ensuring that our services are going to be guided by a human rights and recovery orientated approach. So there are some of the very many issues I, I could speak about today, but I, but I think maybe to conclude, you know, to go back to my opening, this is a crisis, but it also brings an opportunity, a once in a generation opportunity 
to really address the current shortcomings in our system. The future of our mental health services in Ireland will be shaped in the actions that we take in the coming years. Let's not let down our future generations. Let's continue to ensure that we're prioritizing and moving forward um, on our, and delivering the type of mental health service that all of us to date on this hall have agreed are needed and deserved. Thank you. Well, that is a great call to action to end our morning session on Fiona. So thank you for that and for your patience in rejoining us. We're just looking at time and it's a little bit tricky to get a question and answer in at this stage because we are actually running a bit over. You'll see in the Q&A section on Zoom, many of our speakers have come and directly answered your questions. Any that haven't, we'll hold over and use either at the end of session two or at the end of the discussion session at the very end of the conference. We're going to break now. We're going to resume at 11 o'clock. So hopefully that's enough time for a quick comfort break, grab a cup of tea, et cetera, and uh, reflect on what we've heard this morning. So we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock.
Welcome back, everybody. We uh, hope you're all rested and caffeinated and all the rest of it at this stage. We're just going to get straight into it and move on so that we can hopefully get everybody in and sort of get back on time. So we're just going to begin now with our first speaker in the second session, who is Martha Griffin, Chair of the Peer Support and Mental Health Programme and a peer educator with the Recovery College. Um, good morning, everybody. It's quite strange to be sitting in my own house and uh, talking to, I can see over 200 online. So thank you very much for having me. And um, I'm delighted that some of what I'm going to touch on is going to be um, it has been in other people's slides as well. And just, I suppose I'm going to pick up from where Fiona left off and we didn't we didn't uh, look at each other's homework in it. Um, so I just can't see my screen right now. Have you changed the, the slide to number two, please? That'd be great. Um, so I think this was like a Christmas wish list for me when I got the lovely topic of, you know, what would make a great mental health service? And I suppose the key and the cornerstone that I would see is that it's based on human rights, um, upholding and promoting human rights and not just making sure that human rights violations don't occur and the people accessing services are seen as right holders and not objects of charity. Um, I suppose nothing without, about us without us. There's a lot of human rights violations that are still go ongoing, I suppose. Um, and I suppose to work to change that. So it's the right to privacy, right to marry, have a family, housing, the right to not be forced into treatment, freedom of movement, um, seen some of the commission's reports and I suppose one that really stood out to me was um, denying people water um, as a method of punishment. Um, sorry, just, uh, just got a note to start my video there. <laughs> um, so the relationship between mental health and human rights is complex and it goes both ways. Human rights violations can negatively impact on mental health and supporting people's human rights can improve recovery outcomes. Um, we need to bring in legislation and I am delighted that the Minister is working to do that, to bring it in line with the rights of the UN Convention of the Rights of People with Disability. And something that I'm hearing as well is that people have difficulty accessing services when they really feel like they need services and that the, trying to leave services when they feel that they don't is a, is a difficulty. I would like to see the removal of all seclusion restraints, practices and forced treatments and a creation of pleasant environments and community-based approaches and rights approaches as well. And I look forward to reading the um, Ireland's reply to the submission on the UNCRPD and what civic society says around that. Could I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, this feeds into human rights, but I put it as a separate slide as well, because I think it's very, very, very important. Um, informed consent is giving permission or agreement for examination or intervention of treatment, following a conversation in which a person has received enough information to enable them to understand the nature of potential risks and benefits of any of the proposed examination interventions or treatments. Um, and I suppose that comes under no forced treatments, giving people choice. The UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disability supports the right to make bad choices. Um, there's a presumption that people have capacity and then if people don't have capacity, they might need some supports. And all of those structures need to be put in place to enable human rights to be at the forefront. And I would ask, is mental health treatment ever life-saving? Um, what would giving some time do or providing some other based, rights-based options do? Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. There's a real power imbalance um, in mental health systems and health systems, I suppose, as well. Um, so we should work to give power back and decision making back to people. Um, yes, clinicians and medicine, they are experts. We are experts on ourselves. Um, not to use coercive powers to get people to comply with treatment. Uh, practitioners reflecting on their practice as well and seeing how that impacts on the people in front of them and developing alternatives in the communities, actively work to empower people and not disempower people. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. Um, a choice of treatments, not just drugs. Drugs are sometimes the only thing that are offered 
um, and people have to search very hard to find alternatives um, like talk therapies, peer supports, even places to go where people can get out the frustration or the anger or whatever's going on into early intervention, recovery, education, hearing voices, groups, safe spaces um, and support for people coming off medication and tapering options. Um, medication and coming off them can be blocked as well, I suppose. Um, listen to people. They know their bodies. They know what works for them. Um, and I heard it earlier as well, and I was going to say it. Um, people with mental health diagnoses live 20 to 25 years of a shorter life. And yes, that can be from physical um, conditions causing death. So I suppose believe people and treat the physical as well as the mental health. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, complaints and the right to be heard and the right for that to change practice if necessary. So having an independent complaint system in place that's easy to access, that is independent, that you might need um, some supports there for people to put that point across and make improvements based on what people feel and family experience and apologies early, um, you know, mistakes are made, we can do better, practice improves, but just a lot of people have been re-traumatized in the um, search for justice to um, try and ensure that what happened to them doesn't happen again. Um, so just, I think, a complaints process that is robust is very important. Next slide, please. Um, and I would be a bit biased here as well, um, using lived experience as a resource. Uh, I've seen the power of peer support, having worked in the Gateway Project in uh, Rat Mines, and um, now looking at the peer support workers that are coming through. Um, and I like the numbers in the College of Psychiatry as well, of having 60 trained every year, that would be amazing. Um, and the peer support workers are coming from a lived experience, but they're also coming from a family experience. So it would be lovely to see 800 or more in the health services. Um, at the moment, we are kind of 20s. Um, so also having recovery communities, peer respites, recovery colleges, peer education and wellness centres um, available in the community would be great. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we need to broaden out our understanding of mental health difficulties, looking beyond symptoms to experiences and seeing whether people's basic rights are being met and working to address those. So maybe the use of disciplines at an earlier stage, like occupational therapy, community development, social work, community and voluntary, um, to support people's basic needs being met, like housing or food or shelter or um, working from a trauma-informed lens and working to empower people um, and support them. And I think we're on to the final slide. Oh, no, second final slide, please. Thank you. Um, stop course of treatment. Builds a rights-based approaches, not as alternatives, but as the norm. Um, and I suppose look at ratios of staff to people. Uh, shortage of staff puts a lot of pressure on staff. Nobody's happy in those systems. Um, so look at what's safe. The, the peer running of crisis houses, um, open dialogue approaches to early interventions to include families so people know what's going on from the start and um, upholding the rights of people that they have expressed um, in a living will um, or before, before they become unwell or that, they, that their wishes are carried out as well. Um, and the final slide for me is trauma-informed practice. Um, so I suppose I wouldn't like to see it, uh, everybody say, well, it has to be trauma is the cause of mental health. There are so many different um, explanations and, and there's so much that we still don't know. Um, but there is a high instance in the research of um, people like, who experience trauma as well. Um, to just an understanding of trauma and its impact, impact on people, um, promoting safe, safe services um, and um, safe relationships within those, um, ensuring that services are culturally competent, um, that they are able to deal with different needs, I suppose, 
women, travelers, LGBT community, migrant communities, there's, you know, different needs within those. Giving people choice and autonomy, sharing power and governance as well, um, that people are inputting into all aspects of the service. Um, and healing happening through relationships with people and always having recovery um, being possible um, to hang on to that hope. So that's, that's my wish list for Christmas. Thank you. Thanks for that, Martha. We appreciate that. Um, I love that you have a wish list for Christmas. That's a lovely, a lovely idea. We'll move swiftly on and now we're going to be hearing from Dr. Amir Niazi, who's the National Clinical Advisor and Group Lead for Mental Health. Uh, thank you, Jen. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I can see the, uh, I was listening to the earlier presentations and, um, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation and like talking to Paul Gilligan and Paul uh, Perrin, like I felt it's an opportunity uh, for me to come and uh, at least give an overview of the role of NCAGL in mental health. Uh, so if I just keep a brief outline of the role, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, like if you see uh, how health service works is that we have a department of health and their role is that they define policies, they write legislation and regulation, and then HSC uh, distributes the health budget and delegates how the services are delivered to CHOs or healthcare organizations. And then uh, we monitor performance and then at a ground level, at an operational level, it's healthcare organizations who deliver services and they develop local strategies and their annual service plans and they deliver the service. So that, that's how we break down or within our service, how the services are delivered. Next slide, please. Just a quick overview of where, how the roles are in HSE. We have a minister who is in the Department of Health and the CEO who is the HSE and then uh, we have the directors, national directors. Uh, there is a clinical, corporate and operational. That's how we divide uh, our services. And within the clinical arm, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, that's where we have the chief clinical officer. And I think in the last six to nine months, you have heard him a lot more um, on, on the media, uh, Colin Henry, who is in that role. And then we have the national directors and the third arm, which is the national clinical advisors. That's where I sit in along with my colleagues who are in acute services in um, primary care and, and, and uh, chronic diseases. And uh, uh, so we work closely uh, with our chief officer and that's how we delegate and how we work together. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, now the NCAGL, if you, the mental health in HSE uh, is delivered uh, again by my colleagues, which provide the secondary care service, which is sectorized. They provide services in general adult camps, old age, rehab. And then we also provide services, which is specialized like forensic services, ID, liaison and substance abuse. Uh, in 2010, a need was felt that we, there are certain areas where we need to develop these clinical programs uh, the purpose of these programs is not to take the work away from my colleagues who deliver services on the ground, but to provide support to them, to provide guidance and also training uh, in areas like eating disorders, which is not their everyday bread and butter. And then certain key uh, patients who are very, very unwell that we used to send abroad for treatment that we can establish something within the country. Uh, so that was the background of why we, uh, started working on the clinical programs. We have uh, five programs at the moment up and running and we are uh, hoping to develop another program. I'll go into deals, details of that. We, I, we also sponsor relevant service improvement projects and I'll give you an example later on. I also have an advisory role with mental health operations and strategy and planning and then also with clinical design and innovation. This arm was very active in the last nine months because of COVID and all the uh, uh, policies that we brought uh, to, to manage services in the last nine months. I also co-chair on the commissioning team along with my 
um, head of National Office of Suicide Prevention, who is also the chair of our uh, strategy and planning, uh, John Meehan. So this is where we decide how for next year, what services will be developed, what kind of funding is going to be allocated for certain services in the country. Then uh, we work uh, with uh, the clinical programs. I work with them with operations and strategy and planning and see how we can make them happen. And then uh, with other NCAGLs like in acute hospitals, chronic diseases, we work and see how we actively support and develop integrated model of care. I report to Colin Henry, but now because of this launcher care integrated working, uh, a colleague who was in this role before me, Siobhan Ibrian, uh, she has taken a national lead of integrated care. So I report to her and then to Colin Henry in that arm. Next slide, please. Now, this is the way um, it, it is in the books that we have three uh, arms that who work together and, and, and advise and deliver services. The clinical arm, that's where my role is. And then strategy where John Meehan is my colleague and in operation, uh, Jim Ryan is my colleague. But I usually say we have a fourth arm which is our service user arm. We have involved them in any decision uh, that we make. And I was listening to my other um, colleague, uh, Martha, who was saying the importance of involvement of peer support service users. And I can reassure her that, yes, we have involved them in all our decisions and in all our planning and, and, and the way we, we deliver our services. Um, next slide, please. Now, if I give you a bit of history about our clinical programs, um, the, 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 the fundamental uh, process or the vision started in around 2010. Uh, that's when the program started. We worked, uh, I think, the, uh, within the HSE, and then we brought uh, the college as a training body on board. So it, it, it wasn't easy at the start. We worked very uh, like with these colleagues to see how we can make that happen. The first three programs which initiated were assessments and management of patients presenting to ED departments following self-harm, and then early intervention in psychosis, and then eating disorders, uh, 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 in, uh, like we are the three programs with which we started. And then we added on the um, ADHD in adults and also the specialist perinatal services. Uh, at the moment, we are working to see if we can develop a program with dual diagnosis, which means people who have comorbid mental illness and substance abuse. Uh, there is a huge gap. I think uh, my colleagues have worked over the last few years to see how we can make that happen because that is not a mental health alone. It's going to be working with primary care, with social care, with all of that. My colleague who is now the president of the college, uh, like he himself worked very hard to see how we can progress this program. So we are uh, hoping, hoping that we will have some news about it uh, in the coming months. And then um, mental health and intellectual disability is another area we are actively trying to work. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the areas is that uh, the trained colleagues, trained uh, staff in this area is a real challenge to uh, gain them, but working with the college and working with HSC and DTP, trying to address with the workforce planning I think that is our focus to see if we can improve on that area. Next slide, please. To give you some of those programs that I've just mentioned, uh, the self-harm program, uh, we have published our model of care. We have started collecting our data. We have recruited all more than 40 people. And we, uh, we are at the moment delivering this program in 24 of the 26 ED departments in the country. The early intervention psychosis program. Again, my colleague uh, Karen O'Connor, um, who is leading this program, uh, they uh, have also published their model of care. We picked three uh, demonstration sites in 2018. We want to learn from that experience how we um, deliver those services. And I think once that process is complete, we are at the moment uh, also evaluating them. I think then we'll go to the next phase and see how many new sites that we can add into this program. Next slide, please. Perinatal, uh, specialist perinatal mental health service, uh, Dr. Margot Wrigley, who is my colleague leading this program. And again, the model of care was published in 2017. We have six hub sites, which means three uh, maternity hospitals in Dublin and then Galway, Cork and um, Electric, uh, Limerick are the three hub sites. 
And then there are three spoke sites for other units where there is uh, a perinatal service being delivered. So we are working with National Women and Infant Program to see how we can deliver this. I think we are at a very advanced stage of this program and almost uh, near completion of, uh, of, of the model of this uh, program. In, HM, in MHID, Dr. Yvonne Jakob, who is uh, working on this program, they are almost uh, finalizing their model of care. And I think we will be uh, progressing on it, um, hopefully in the next year. I think they have a whole day of training uh, early next year. Next slide, please. And then the final two, the eating disorder program, my colleague, Dr. Michelle Clifford, who is leading it, we have published the model of care. Again, we picked three pilot sites. We appointed uh, colleagues in those sites. And then uh, hopefully in the coming years, we will be expanding these uh, uh, sites to see if we can roll on this program at a national level. The adult ADHD program, again, it is led by Dr. Margot Wrigley. Uh, we are at the final stages of the model of care and hopefully we'll be publishing no, it. Amir seems to have just, oh, yeah. And then uh, we will be finalizing the three demonstration sites and we see how we, uh, how we move on it. Next slide, please. Along with these clinical programs, next slide, please. Uh, this is some of the examples of service improvement programs that uh, my office is engaged in. Uh, this is a very small list that I've shown you. There were almost more than 25 service improvement projects, but I think uh, I took this role in the middle of this pandemic. And I think uh, what I'm doing these days is not my actual job uh, because 60 or 70% of what I'm doing is related to COVID-19. But these are the kind of uh, projects which uh, the role is engaged and involved in. Uh, and I will be taking on these ones. Other than these ones, if you go to the next slide, uh, I'm working closely with the uh, chief clinical officer, like the, the, the vision for change refresh. And I think the minister earlier on mentioned about the uh, monitoring committee that she has established. So we will be working with them, uh, like implementing of the program for government and Sloan care. These are our areas. And then uh, I think uh, the review of mental health act, certain colleagues um, um, in our uh, discipline are involved in that review and hopefully we will uh, have that completed uh, early next year. Uh, there is a very, very close working relationship with the college, looking at our workforce planning, looking at our training and the SLAs, that's what we are working on. So I also sit on their management uh, uh, committee and, and, and bring issues from them and from the HSE to the college and we discuss, discuss them at that forum. Uh, the National Forensic Service, I think everybody's aware that we are very hopeful that early next year, our new uh, forensic hospital in Portran hopefully will become operational. I think it's, uh, we will be, that building will be handed over to us before the end of the year. And then we will be working to see how we can start working in that new facility. All the, at the moment, applications which are related to mental health for treatment abroad scheme uh, come to our office, we look at them. And I think that is where we started thinking about developing these clinical programs and started working on them. Uh, another area which my office is actively engaged in to see how we can develop transgender service. We already have something in adults, but in camps, uh, I think uh, my colleagues earlier on have worked a lot and I'm just taking that work forward and see how we can complete it. Next slide, please. Uh, in the last six months, we worked very closely with NDTP, which is the National Doctors Training and Planning in HSE. And that is where I think even consultants who works in private sector, uh, in St. Pat's, John of God's and other areas, uh, we, uh, we, we included them, we involved them. So we looked at our overall medical workforce planning uh, there is an active process because we know that uh, consultant recruitment and retention is, uh, is a major issue that we are trying to address. Uh, there are challenges in governance, how uh, the role of consultants and the role of psychiatrists within the service, we are trying to work and clarify that. Uh, and again, I'm involved in all consultant appointments in an advisory committee, like all the applications about mental health, uh, I present them to this committee uh, and make sure that uh, we go through this process and uh, recruit them. Uh, the SPIRE fellowships in mental health, um, 
like I sit on the committee where we work on them. I think there are additional uh, post CCST fellowships that we have managed to achieve this year. And I'll be very keen if my colleagues from St. Pat's or from, uh, from other area uh, who have uh, these candidates or, or, or any uh, suggestions, I'll be willing to listen and work with them and see how we can, how we can make them happen. Last slide. Um, if we look at our strategic priorities, uh, at the moment, we'll continue to, to develop our clinical programs and service improvement projects, and also uh, actively working to develop in the model of care for dual diagnosis, which is in line with the sharing of vision and also which was uh, said in our program for government and staunch care. So that is very, very um, topical at the moment that we are working on. And then uh, the recruitment of specialized team in these clinical programs and then uh, working for their offices, states, and their telehealth requirements is another area that we are very uh, closely working together. Uh, the engagement with Department of Health, College of Psychiatry, the NDTP, I think um, we can say, um, like especially talking to um, my colleagues like Fiona Coyle earlier on said that the funding needs to be uh, allocated for mental health. I can uh, reassure her that I think the minister uh, is very keen to support mental health. And uh, I think the funding that we got this year was better than other. There was some query that why we were not included in winter planning and all of that. But I can reassure that in our estimate process, we got everything that we would have included in inter winter planning. Certainly we need more funding. Certainly we are not there yet. Uh, there are huge gaps we need to identify, but that is the job we are trying our best to uh, highlight those issues and bring them to those forums where they need to be heard. Uh, and then uh, to promote the impact of COVID-19 on mental health service, I can tell you uh, in the last nine months, uh, my colleagues, the way they have changed their practice, like it wasn't easy to complete, completely revolutionize the delivery of care. They were always used to face-to-face -face interviews, moving them from there to this telehealth and then colleagues in my office like Andrew and other colleagues who worked on this blue eye and uh, attend anywhere. I think uh, it was remarkable the, we, the way my colleagues adopted to this new way of working and how they have worked uh, in this area. And then um, at the moment we are trying to commission a clinical reporting system for mental health clinical programs with a view that going forward that if this could uh, develop in something in overall mental health that we can share. So I think uh, that is something for the last 10 years we have been trying, but uh, I think probably COVID has given us a little bit more uh, understanding how this can be done quicker, but we are working on it. That's some of those things that uh, my office is involved and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Niazi. That was great. And just to, as you mentioned, that you'll stay on for some questions at the end, just to remind all of our speakers in this session, if you were able to do that, that would be great, just so that we can put some of our audience's questions to you at the end. We move on now and join Doc, or Mark Smith, who's the president of the Psychological Society of Ireland and a CAMS senior clinical psychologist. Good morning, Mark. Morning, Jan. Morning, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, working. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invite to speak this morning about shaping the future of mental health care. As Jan said, my name is Mark Smith. I am the current president of the Psychological Society of Ireland and also a senior clinical psychologist working in CAMS and one of the team coordinators. So just a very small bit about PSI. We are a representative body for all psychologists in Ireland. We've about three and a half thousand members. And all of our members would work in mental health, ranging from assistant psychologists to clinical counselling and educational psychologists. And we, we work across the, the lifespan. Unfortunately, Fiona Coyle stole my Cinderella reference from earlier on, but I'm just going to add to it a little bit and note is that what I would really like is that we would get to a point where mental health services no longer need to be referenced as, as the Cinderella of our, of our health services. But as Cinderella has also said, that it would be nice to be able to stop dreaming about what our mental health service could and should look like, and that would work for the betterment of the services and, and the people who, who use those services. So what should we be dreaming of? So let's start with the reality of what makes the world go round. And as Jerry Maguire has so eloquently put it, show me the money. 
Um, we know that our mental health budget is approximately five to 6% of our overall health budget. And as we know, it needs to be between 10 to 12%. So that is an urgent requirement. But if we have money, what, what does it need to be used for? What should we be using it for? Bums on seats. We, we need more staff. We know there are huge gaps in staffing levels across all disciplines within our mental health services. And from my point of view, one of the main reasons I think that we didn't get to the vision that the our original mental health policy, Vision for Change, set out was that we didn't provide the funding to get those staff there. And we really have to, to properly fund mental health services if we're going to make the necessary strides that we need for those changes. We've also made, I think, huge and very positive strides over the years in reducing stigma in relation to mental health and encouraging people to come forward. But in, in doing so, I think we also have a responsibility to ensure that there's actually somebody there to listen and support when you come forward. I don't think there's anything more disheartening than to give that person that message that you should come forward, you should share your mental health story, seek help to be told that you have a one, two year waiting list for that story to be heard. It isn't good enough. So what we do need is, is the funding to be used for more staff, um, but we also need to protect our existing and our future staff and reduce the risk of burnout. COVID-19 has resulted in, in massively increased pressures on an already pressurized mental health system and staff are working to the best of their ability, but they're a finite resource. Their energy levels are a finite resource. And I do believe, I think Manny's do, the, the mental health impact of COVID is going to live long after the mental, the physical health curve has been flattened. And, and essentially we have to care for the carers too, by making sure that there's enough of them available to support the people that we work with, but also each other. I also think that a future mental health service needs to change the focus and the outcomes of what we have looked at traditionally. So unlike needing more staff, success in a mental health service is more than just bums on seats. It's not about key statistics, key performance indicators of how many people did you see. A service should be driven by the goals of the person who's actually using that service, what it is that they are looking for help and support with. But not just the goals themselves, we also need to be capturing the journey of the person from point of referral to point of acceptance to point of discharge. What did that journey look like? And I think more importantly, we have to be asking the question, and this needs to be a key performance indicator for a well-functioning mental health service, is we need to be asking the question, what was your experience? Did you feel respected? Did you feel supported? And I think hearing the person's voice is the way that we do that. Was your voice heard during that journey through mental health services? Sharing the vision has outlined much improved ways of ensuring those voices of those with lived experiences, influences and in service or services and our policies. But I think we can go a lot further. What I would like to see is service users on our area mental health management committees and recruitment of staff and involved in all aspects and running of the services that they see. It was referenced a few times today, and I want to echo this call again, we need electronic records, but we have to ask the question, why is it important? For me, I think there's one crucial aspect to it. When you survey people who access mental health services, one of the most consistent frustrations they report back is having to retell their story over and over and over again, within services, between services. Electronics records would mean that a person's narrative and their story doesn't have to be retold over and over again. It's accessible, it's there. I think it would be a, a fair question to be asked uh, if, if we ask someone to retell their story, what, why should I? So that, that rollout of an electronic service needs to happen and it needs to happen pretty quickly. One of the things that, that I really struggle with working in CAMS is the amount of people and, and particularly young parents and families who in a crisis present to any where there's no acute medical risk but it's the only place that they can seek help when they're struggling. So what I would like to see is that a, a well-functioning mental health service will be one that is primarily community-based. And if there isn't an acute medical crisis, that we don't need to rely on, on children and families having to present to a &E departments. For as long as I can remember, every year we see these newspaper headlines and about how unacceptable, I think we all agree, um, how unacceptable it is that children should not be placed in acute psychiatric units. But each year we see these newspaper headlines, we all talk about how unacceptable it is, how it needs to stop, but yet we keep seeing it year after year after year. And these are newspaper headlines for the past five years, all saying the same thing. So I think we'll have created a mental health service that works when we no longer need to see mental health headlines like this again. 
Myself and PSI are fully supportive of the plan as envisaged by sharing the vision to extend the range of CAMs to 25. I know not all are in agreement, but from my, my point of view, working with an 18 year old who leaves CAMs, moves on to adult services and sits in a school uniform, just about to sit there leaving cert in an adult service, sometimes with people in their 40s, 50s and 60s, is not the most appropriate place for them. We know these models work. We've seen it in Australia with the origin services. We've seen it with our colleagues in Jigsaw. But to make this work, we need the resources. We need the bums on seats. We know that from a vision for change that only 30%, 33% of the psychologists and CAMs are actually in post. So to make this work for young people, for those services, we need those staff in place. I want to focus a little bit on what I think the ethos of an, of an excellent mental health service would look like in CAMs in particular. And for me, it needs to be so much more than an expectation of individual therapy, of sitting down with a young person for one-to-one -one therapy. It is important, but I think the question that we're not asking that we need to start asking is what support does this family need? What support do these parents need? We see increasing numbers of young people presenting to CAMS where their parents also struggle with their mental health. And we don't have integrated services where we support both the family, the young person and their parents with, with those needs. What I think we need to do is we need to move to re-embed family therapy within our mental health services. Early in my career, I worked in a service where there was a very strong family therapy ethos and we had a family therapy team, which made a huge difference to the outcomes of not just the young people, but also their families, because it looked at the relationships, the strains that occur when mental health is something that, that families struggle with. So I think we need to work on how we embed those family therapy training and trained clinicians within the services that we have. I think this is, this is crucial. This is, I suppose, not rocket science to any of you who are here, but early intervention is key. We know that CAMs and adult services can have and do have extremely long waiting lists, and we need to reduce the pressure on those services by providing early intervention by front-loading our primary care psychology services as envisioned by Slanty Care. So this is where the funding needs to go, get in early, provide the help, provide that support at a, at, a, at a primary level when the difficulties are in the mild range, which will reduce pressure on, on, our, on our specialist services. When I put this previous submission together, I was asked by a colleague that, you know, they found it interesting that I work in CAMS, but we didn't ask for any additional CAM psychologists. And I explained that, if you sit on a waiting list for up to two years, as it is in some parts of the country, to see a primary care psychologist for a mild difficulty, by the time you get to the see that psychologist, your difficulty could be moved on to moderate and need more specialist services. So by providing one additional psychologist in every primary care centre for the paltry sum of 16 million euro, we could potentially clear the 10,000 people who are waiting for a primary care list. So we need further investment and we need early intervention. But what I'd like to do to finish is to mention a group of children and a group of young people that I do firmly believe have been failed by our mental health system for too long, and those are people on the autism spectrum. We need to move away from mental health silos where we exist opposite each other and not with each other. And we need to provide integrated care to those young people, families and adults who have ASD needs. We need to move away from a narrative that their ASD needs need to be met before their mental health needs can. There is no line between ASD needs and mental health needs. They coexist. They can't be divided out. And we have to envisage and we have to action a no wrong door policy so that from in particular people on the autism spectrum get the help they need when they need it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, my fingers hit the wrong button there to start my video and unmute myself. Um, that's great. I've just noticed coming in on the comments, people are wondering about the email for CPD. So if you're looking for the CPD points, it's communications at saintpatsmail.com. That's communications at saintpatsmail.com. Okay, we'll move on. Now we're delighted to be joined by the CEO of Jigsaw, Joseph Duffy. Good morning, everybody. I'm just working here to share my screen with you all. Once I do that, I'll be up and running. 
Okay, so good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to present to you today. I'm going to talk about youth mental health. And as you can, will have heard already, young people have been referred to a number of times this morning. I suppose the question arises about why would we focus on young people? And I suppose we know young youth mental health is a concern. It's a concern because we know that it's a leading cause of disability and poor life outcomes for young people. But we also know that about 50% uh, of all mental health disorders occur before the age of 15 and 75% 75 by, by the age of 25. So it's a key group that we need to be concerned about and to support. And thinking about an Irish context, uh, the Central Statistics Office did some modelling um, a couple of years ago, looking at population projections and looking at those for, for the next 35 years by any of their projections of six different scenarios, they're, they're showing there is an increase in, in young people. There's going to be an increase in the population. So focusing on young people is, 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 a, is something that we need to continue to do and to, to do more often. Looking at some Irish evidence, Jigsaw has worked with UCD um, twice now to develop uh, the My World survey. This is a snapshot of one of the measures that we looked at in terms of looking at the severity of depression. It gives you a sense in terms of time one and time two of the survey. The first survey was conducted in, the data was gathered in 2010. The last data was gathered in 2019. What you can see on all of the indicators there in terms of looking at this, just this one measure of, of depression, it's all moving, but it's moving um, really in, in the wrong direction. We know that, that mental health problems are increasing. So what, what has been done uh, about this? What are, how are we responding to it? Over the past 15 years internationally, there's been a significant movement in terms of trying to reorganize, rethink about youth mental health and building on what previous speakers have said and what, what Mark Smith has just said. There's a, a greater focus on, on young people and also looking at starting earlier and intervening earlier. So Jigsaw is part of a worldwide movement. Origin has been mentioned in Australia. Headspace is also in Australia and Foundry is, is in, in Canada, just to name some, some of the examples um, in terms of what's been developed out there. Those services, all of us together, are looking at what are the key characteristics of youth mental health services. We've been doing some work together with the World Economic Forum and with Origin in particular, focused on how would we know that, or what are the particular attributes of services? So a base in primary care is hugely important. It's important because that's connected within the health system, that it's integrated in terms of care. There's a youth-centered philosophy. We're thinking about young people at the center of this. It must be accessible. We need to have youth-friendly facilities. The days of having a service tacked on to a psychiatric hospital is not, is not acceptable, It's not, and it's also not, uh, not accessible. It's about embedding those facilities directly in the community, connected with the community, owned by the community, supported by the community. What also has been referenced by a number of speakers this morning is the importance of evidence-based care. And that's cert certainly something that's really developed over the last 15 years. Adding to this and thinking about the work that we do, particularly in Jigsaw, that's supported by HSC and our online work supported by Sláinte Care, Within Jigsaw, we provide a range of free one-to-one -one therapeutic sessions for young people aged 12 to 25. We're the only service on these islands that provides that uh, support to young people across that age range. We believe it's hugely important. We know from international evidence and we know from Irish evidence that young people are entering into adolescence earlier, but also pathway into a secure and productive adulthood is taking longer. So the importance of providing services that are strongest, where in the past they were very weak between the age of 16 and, and 25 are hugely important. And we also believe in terms of supporting them from the age of 12. We offer community-based programs um, that are literally supporting young people where they live, learn, work and play. Really important in terms of supporting them in the community and very much seeing this from a psychosocial model. We undertake pioneering research and I suppose robust evaluation of everything that we do. It's hugely important in terms of contributing to the sector, but also understanding how we can further develop the sector. We provide a range of e-mental health supports. We also have provided um, a secondary school pro program for 10% of the secondary schools in Ireland called One Good School. We recently received some new funding to provide um, online support or a schools hub for every single school in Ireland. That will be something that will be happening um, very early in the new year. 
In, in looking at, at, at where we are, we have uh, 14 services across the country. We're soon to open a service in Tipperary. The service in Wicklow will start taking referrals very soon. The idea is that these services, supported by the HSE, are embedded within their communities and connecting young people. As you can see, not every community has a direct support for, um, for young people, but it's something that we, we would aspire to in the future. The impact of COVID-19, this has been something that's been referred to a number of times by people already this morning. Um, in March, uh, effectively, the predominant or the, really the only mode of support that was offered to young people within Jigsaw was face-to-face -face support. That was very much in common with every other mental health service. We had developed some supports online. Uh, we were piloting those. But effectively, now looking at this in November, face-to-face -face is taking up approximately half of our, of our supports. We reopened our face-to-face -face supports in July uh, at the end of, of, of the phasing of the previous um, lockdown. And we've continued to keep those services open um, during the current lockdown. We now offer a blended model. We offer um, live chat online, which is an anonymous support that, uh, that, that young people can access. We have a free phone number and we have various different webinars. The next slide, I'll spend a bit of time on this. This gives you an example or an idea really about data. It's, it's obviously a, a point in time as in uh, this week, looking at this, the various supports that are there. But we went from a service that was predominantly face-to-face -to, -face to a service that is providing a range of supports to young people, their parents and those who support young people are teachers. Um, we provide phone calls, videos, uh, in-person sessions. The 1-800 number was something that we introduced. So we went from providing support in 14 areas around the country to providing na nationwide support. So overnight, we, we went effectively nationwide. We've had almost a thousand consultations on that, um, uh, that helpline, which is also uh, allows for email and for um, text messaging. What's been really, really interesting about that is that it provides support for parents. It provides that connection. And about a third of our work overall is involved in consultations, in supporting young people and supporting their parents and supporting their teachers to help them navigate the health service system. The live chat, which, is, which operates as supported by Solange Care, that work predominantly now, over 50% of the young people accessing that are over 18. Um, and it's really interesting in terms of providing support in that anonymous way that is also, also for some of them, the first step in terms of connecting with the, with the service. We've significantly increased the amount of information that we have available on our, our website. We have developed webinars, but of particular, I suppose, interest is we have developed a significant courses for teachers. We've had over 12,000 teachers sign up. Uh, there's about 65,000 teachers in the country, so that's a significant proportion of them. And at the moment, those courses will take, there's five or six uh, modules within them, they'll take a, a bit of time to complete, but we have about 6,300 completed at this stage. In looking at some of the presenting issues um, for young people, pre-COVID, I suppose in terms of the period up till the 12th of March, we would have seen anxiety, low mood, sleep changes, stress, anger, as some of the key issues that were presented by, by young people. For looking at the next period up until uh, up until July, um, there would have been similar issues, um, but family problems emerged as 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 being more more predominant there. Some of the key themes that have emerged, as I've said in the previous slide: anxiety, low mood, stress, family problems, conflict at home. Isolation from social and community settings is a, is a growing and emerging theme. We estimate, and sometimes young people don't um, don't always um, uh, talk about the context of COVID, but we know about a third of, of young people who come to us say their mental health is impacted by COVID-19. Um, the remainder are pre-existing mental health concerns. I suppose it's really important in terms of the context to know that not everything that the young people are coming uh, to Jigsaw for is because of COVID. I think there's, it's really important in terms of understanding we're dealing with a vulnerable group and a group that had particular needs already. This is evident in terms of looking at some of our referral data over the last three years. We know that demand is increasing. It's not just due to COVID-19. We see particular patterns uh, within the year Certainly the, the September, October time, the return to school always has seen significant referrals. But as you can see, there's about a 25% increase year on year for the last three years. Um, those are, those uh, referrals have obviously increased. We know 
that stigma has been somewhat addressed, although it's still there. We know as an organization, uh, people know more about Jigsaw. So we would expect an upward trend in terms of people being able to access the service, but also we, wouldn't, we, we can see that that demand is steadily increasing. What does the future hold? I suppose what's really important is that we know demand is increasing, but it's important about how we respond to this. We, we spend a lot of time and, and part of the reason we have a conference like today is about encouraging more people to access support. So it's really important when we see that demand is increasing, not necessarily to see that as a failure, but to see it as for particularly for some young people in our case, they're accessing support for, for the first time at an early intervention stage. So that's hugely important. It's really important, I think it's been a common theme across this morning, the need for greater integration within the mental health system. So I think that that's the, very much the work that we're involved in, hopefully sharing the vision will, will help with that. And conferences like this in terms of helping um, all different agencies to understand the role that each of us play and to see mental health as a system, as a systemic approach to it. Um, I suppose the, it's really important in terms of there's more focus on prevention and on mental health promotion, the importance of community, the importance of, of, um, of what we all can do to support young people, the importance of early intervention at each stage of a mental health process. Um, as is being demonstrated by myself and by others, the importance of a blended, a blended model in terms of technologies on and offline. Also the importance of research in terms of adding to this area. And particularly, I suppose, in research is about novel interventions for youth mental health, looking at ways that we can really support young people to use technologies. And also the idea in terms of using technology, um, we have a strong, I suppose, growing evidence base in terms of the complementary nature of, of, um, of e-health and of, of, uh, of technology, but we need to develop a much stronger base around that and how we can further support the work that we do. What I want to end with really, I suppose, is providing some voices from young people themselves in terms of some feedback about the work and the experience they had in attending Jigsaw. This is from three different people from three different services around the country. And it's really important in terms of that early intervention stage, in terms of helping young people to get an understanding and, and very much the model within Jigsaw is build the skills that they can then take and use uh, for, for their future mental health. So improving their mindset, how they view themselves, their life and their situations. Coming out of a dark place, but also looking at the, the, the self-defeating patterns and for a young person to understand that and then to be able to talk to peers about it in a very positive way. The number of referrals we get from other young people is growing steadily over the number of years. Uh, but also Jigsaw acknowledging and helping young people uh, in terms of their feelings and be able to grow and learning coping skills and necessary tools for better mental health in the future. So that's a very quick uh, snapshot of the work. So I would like to finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Joseph. That was great. Thanks so much. Um, we'll move on now. Our next speaker is Kevin Jones. And Kevin Jones is board member and former Secretary General at UFAMI. Thank you very much indeed, Jan, and I hope everyone can hear me. I'm just going to see if I can share my uh, screen. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much. As I say, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak today at this important conference. And um, before I uh, move on to the pres my small presentation, which for the next 10 minutes, I hope to focus on uh, the whole aspect of families and the family's involvement in mental health, just to give you a little bit of uh, an insight into who UFAMI is. UFAMI is a, an NGO based in Belgium. It's been in existence since 1992, and it, is, it was org organized specifically to improve uh, to, the care and welfare for families affected by mental health. Um, and its mission is to the voice of family members of people affected by severe mental illness. Um, one of the founding members of UFAMI was uh, Schizophrenia Ireland here, um, which is now operating, of course, as SHINE. And, um, has Shine has taken a, a very active role within UFAMI. Uh, I uh, have worked for 10 years as Secretary General also at UFAMI. UFAMI has um, 
roughly uh, around 20. Th these numbers change somewhat. In fact, I think they need to be updated because I believe that there's now only 27 member countries of Europe. But anyway, there's we, we, we cover uh, quite a, a stretch of Europe of family associations uh, and other associated uh, health, uh, mental health associations. Um, I was reading in the last while um, the vision for change again, and it, it's it's welcoming to 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 see that the the families are being recognised and and recognised as an integral part of the whole mental health sphere. Uh, you know, families do carry out a very important role in the care and treatment of their loved ones. Um, now, that's not to say they, that families want to get involved in the, anything to do with the medical side of, of, of the treatment, but they're there and they have a very important role to play. Their caring role is a very important one because the majority of caring is actually fulfilled by family members. They also can act very, very uh, much as an early warning system and, and monitoring the condition of their loved ones, especially when there is uh, uh, the likelihood of a relapse or the onset of uh, somewhat of a re relapse. Um, however, families are recognized as having a role, but I don't believe in fact that it's very well integrated and the, the word in integration has been used a few times already and I, 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 I'm using it again in this context. In, in the whole area of planning development, implementation, training and the service and support, uh, uh, there's certainly a, a, a large need for the, um, the families to be involved and to actually consider the needs and the requirements and the rights of the families. And by families, we don't only mean families, uh, the family member who cares, but also all members, because all members within a family are affected by mental health issues when they come into the household. Not, not everything is, is negative, of course, but uh, the situation I think in, in respect to families is what I would almost describe like a parson's eggs, good in, in some spots, not so good in the others. And it's, it's a very hit and miss um, sort of situation. But what I would like to do this morning and the next few minutes is to examine a little bit more of the European situation and to see what we can learn, especially in regards to families and carers. Um, and surprisingly, uh, from the work that uh, has been going on in Euphemy, I can tell you that Ireland fares well, or maybe we should say not so well, but overall it, it's in line with the European uh, perspective and the European situation in relation to families. There are, of course, some leaders when it comes to the recognition and support of families. And I specifically think of some of the countries in the Nordic area. But um, as I say, it, it's important also that for families uh, in, in, in Ireland and across other countries to actually advance the cause and to, uh, of what families want and what their needs and rights are, uh, especially amongst policymakers and key influencers, there is a need for hard evidence and figures because that's what people and what legislators uh, listen to. They, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence we can provide, but there is quite a lack of qualitative and quantitative uh, well, data uh, about families and the situations of families. And so UFAMI over the last number of years uh, undertook two very important uh, surveys. Uh, the first one was about these conditions of, of, of cares and families. And we uh, took, uh, it took place in 28, 22 countries across Europe. We had over 1,100 respondents and was, we, we worked it with the University of Leuven in Belgium. And more recently, we have undertaken quite a, a large survey of family carers, uh, specifically focused on the economic side of caring, uh, where we ha have uh, 740 respondents. And that was with the London School of Economics and um, so, uh, so, uh, Political Science. Generally, I would have to say from the uh, 
results that uh, Ireland that the data stacks up well in uh, relation to the overall mean data that was found with uh, from the, the survey. Uh, not surprisingly, one of the, 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 uh, the uh, findings of the survey was that the typical profile of a family carer is that the, the, uh, the female aged of 60 or over and approximately 75% are caring for a daughter or a son. And also not surprisingly, the two big issues that come has have come from those uh, surveys is that the future, you know, families are worried about the future and over 55% would have said that and over half of the respondents are very, all very much worried about the whole is aspect of finance and, 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 and the, the future going forward. So hand in hand, future and financial. But looking specifically at the, what, what families and family carers are reporting, 33% uh, report feelings of depression, while 20% of reporting exhaustion cannot function properly, and 33% and uh, report that their physical health has deteriorated, with over 50, half of, of respondents saying they are concerned with physical health. And again, 33% uh, report increased isolation and loneliness. And this is, these are stark uh, findings coming from people who are out there caring for, on a daily basis, their loved ones. They also feel that carer support is lacking, that the support for, their, for themselves is lacking, that their voice is often unheard. 40%, in fact, re have reported overall uh, of, the, of the survey uh, dissatisfied with how they are being treated and their work with the doctor. And between 33 and 40% feel they're, they're not actually being taken seriously and that there is a, a lack of commitment. So while there is a recognition that families have an involvement and have a role to play, but they also feel that there's quite a lack of commitment and that there's very little, if no involvement in any form of decision-making. In the recent survey with the London School of Economics, it, you know, a very stark finding is that family carers, on average, you know, care their the caring hours that they that they spend per week is greater than the average working week. The average reported is 43 hours of caring, and it, it, some of the questions uh, that the, the uh, respondents were asked were to put some sort of value on an hour of their caring. And the, the figures range from 23, over 23 euro to 28 euro. And so if, if, you ex, if it's extrapolated from an economic perspective, the annual value of between six is, of, of caring of a carer is between 61,000 and 75,000 euro, quite a lot. And then when you actually consider that in terms of the, the, the what a return of investment would be if there was better services for carers and for families. 43% have reported that they've had to reduce the other activities, especially work with 33% have had to reduce educational activities that they've been involved in. And then over half have said that they have not had time to do any, and they've had to reduce their volunteering. 15% um, have reported that only 15% that they receive any other form of formal caring. COVID-19 has been, I think, mentioned in every presentation to date. And uh, we had the opportunity to have uh, a, a very rapid survey with the London School of Economics. And we uh, uh, surveyed 350 carers. Levels of loneliness and family cares have increased. And in fact, in some cases, and in many cases, it, this is bordering on it's severely lonely. Um, the, the mean number of hours per week has actually increased from the 43, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, now to 58. Quite a, a, a stark increase. And the quality of life scores for family cares, they again, on the other side, they've gone down 
since before the pandemic uh, hit. Just uh, finally to um, speak about some of the recommendations and, and these may should be taken into account, I believe, especially as we're going and we're talking about the, the shaping the future of mental health service in Ireland. There is a need for more investment in the area of respite and focused support services for families and family carers. There is a greater need for investment in, in to alleviate levels of loneliness that are expect, experienced by family carers. And also, I think it's important that, the, uh, that we have to improve the evidence base of the value of caring by implementing what we call longitudinal studies of family carers. Support research, uh, we need to, there needs to be more support for research to identify the actual economic value and impact of what uh, families and family carers contribute. And uh, before I wrap up, just a, another few recommendations that came from these surveys and which I think should be taken on board, certainly, is the implementation of additional support services families, co concentrating very much on quality of life and loneliness. And more integration, more seamless integration uh, of families and family associations into the whole area of the mental health service. It's important, I think, also that families are mainstreamed into what we would term future medical education. And it's important also that the increase, uh, there's, there's an increased uh, awareness of risk to health in general for family members, especially those who provide the care. Data I mentioned is important and it's important to, to, to collect uh, regular uh, amounts of data. And I think it's important that there should be a, a, a regular information collection to help inform policy going forward and the debate uh, going forward. And finally, there is very much a need for the increased use of what we would term carer assessments in order to identify the needs and the rights and the supports required by family members. I think I've, uh, I've run out of uh, about my time. So uh, thank you very much indeed for your attention. And I will uh, hand back to Jan, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And yes, gold star on the timing, <laughs> which is always great from our perspective. Uh, we're going to move on now to our final speaker of this session before we get into the questions and comments. And you've all been sending in really interesting questions and comments. So we will have time, hopefully, to get into those at the end of this session, which is great. So I'll hand over now to the final speaker of this session, who is Dr. Damien Brennan from the School of Nursing and Midwifery at TCD. OK, thank you, uh, Jan. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak at this conference today. Um, before I start, I'd like to um, also acknowledge and thank St. Patrick's um, for their work they've done over the last nine months. Uh, I'm the Director of Undergraduate Teaching and Learning at Trinity College, and we've had a number of students rotating through your services. This has been a big challenge, and um, our students have been fantastic, and our services have been fantastic during that time. Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, I hope. Is that... Coming up, it should have, yes. Can you confirm if the... Uh... Yes, perfect, all good, thanks, Jamie. Oh, that's okay, thank you. I'll just start on this now. Okay. Okay, so I'm hoping you can see my screen. So um, <clears throat> what I really want to address today is looking at the foundations of um, the Irish mental health system and to see how well placed that is or otherwise in meeting the needs expressed through our current policy documents, including uh, sharing uh, the vision. What I'm really interested in is how do we uh, develop a contemporary national response to our mental health difficulties that is not bound and shaped by the structures, systems of professional practice developed within our historical institutional response to mental illness. So what I'm wondering is, has our institutional response to mental illness, our historical institutional response, 
placed us well to meet the challenges that we have ourselves have expressed uh, need to be met. Okay, so very quickly to, uh, to understand that, we need to understand what has happened in Ireland and our institutional response and how that has progressed. So firstly, we need to understand the sums. There's two lines here. The first is our uh, national population statistic. That's the blue line. And the bottom line is the number of people in our residential institutions. St. Patrick's would have been a small element of that. Generally, we're looking at the national system, which developed from the 1817 uh, Select Committee to consider the state of lunatic poor in Ireland. Um, Post-independence, we have a continued uh, population trajectory. The number of people in our residential institutions continues and it rises to a high point around the mid 1950s and then it falls thereafter. So if we combine all of that, we end up with a, a picture of our residential service provision over a long period of time. And this is what has informed the contemporary professional structures, built environments, staffing arrangements, and so on within our contemporary mental health system. Similar to our national school system, um, which was formed in 1832-33, uh, our contemporary primary school system is very much based on the systems and structures established that you know some time ago, and that's similar to our contemporary mental health uh, systems and structures. So how do we understand this very unusual pattern of uh, residential service provision and where does that leave us? Well, first of all, we need to compare that internationally. And this is the subject of my PhD a number of years ago and my publication, Irish Insanity, 1800 to 2000. But we really needed to understand this in the international context. So I did some international comparative uh, work on this. And here's just over three periods of time, um, England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And the pattern is similar. However, the volatility of the Irish uh, experience is uh, much greater. So we had a much more radical increase in decline of our residential institutions. And based on the WHO figures, I ran a comparative analysis. And it was often said that Ireland has the highest rate. But when you look for the sums, they're difficult to find. So I did the sums. And indeed, in the 1950s, if you use the WHO figures at that time, Ireland does come uh, first out of uh, 84 countries I could get reliable statistics from uh, that period of time. So Ireland is pretty uh, interesting in that we very much intensely use these institutions, and therefore we have a strong legacy from them. That legacy can be a benefit, but it can also be a hindrance going forward. So um, if we have a look at this and try and explain, well, what drove this? There is a number of established theories, but I want to suggest that they don't really explain the Irish case too well. The first established theory, which I find problematic, is that the Irish are very mentally unwell. And this has been stated continuously from 1817. There's a um, quote from the report of the Select Committee considered the state of lunatic poor in Ireland, which suggests that Ireland is very unique in having high levels of mental illness. This was repeated again in the 1966 report uh, or the Commission on, uh, of Inquiry and Mental Illness. And for instance, in uh, 2013, the report from the Royal College of Surgeons again suggested this. I think we need to be very cautious with this narrative that Irish young and older people have a particular uh, propensity towards uh, mental illness. I think we need to be very careful uh, with that narrative that we don't consider ourselves too unique within the European or global uh, context without evidence to hard evidence uh, to uh, back that. There's a number of other theories that would suggest that uh, institutional uh, utilization was linked to, for instance, the rise of capitalism across Europe. This is a very good theory uh, by Skull and others. Uh, however, Ireland really didn't do advanced capitalism or industrialization in a similar fashion to the way France and Germany and Great Britain did. We were a late arriver to modernity. So that theory, while Ireland having its very high rates, should have really been an example of these theories. And yes, when you unpick the theories, they don't really fit well to the Irish case. If you have a look at industrialization across Ireland internally, you'll see high levels of utilization of uh, psychiatric services and mental hospitals really had little to do with where it was highly industrialized. Waterford and Cork were very rural during the uh, 1840s and right through the uh, 20th century. You see service provision was really the key indicator 
of high levels of utilization and high levels of diagnosis. So that's interesting, particularly if you look at uh, rural areas, Badmus Low, Wexford, and so on. That becomes very interesting. Okay, so it wasn't industrialization or capitalism, and I don't think it was because the Irish were particularly mentally unwell. There is theories around the private enterprise or a market in mental illness. And this suggests that, um, similar to the critique of contemporary uh, American prisons, where you've got private interests uh, in some of those prison systems, that private interests really drove mental hospital expansion. That really isn't the, the case. We had very little private service provision in Ireland. At our height, when we had about 21,000 people in our psychiatric hospitals, uh, only about 1,000 of them were in our private uh, mental hospitals. So that theory by uh, Perry Jones and others doesn't really hold the Irish case. A number of theorists, and there's been a number of recent papers over the last number of years that would suggest that the famine, the Irish famine, which was a horrific event, uh, stimulated high levels of mental hospital utilization. And um, it doesn't really follow through. If you have a look at statistics, if you read by publications, you'll see that the famine uh, in terms of mental hospital utilization was a blip rather than a trend. Uh, we used mental hospitals before, during and after, and other countries had had, have had famines. Uh, internationally, and they're not necessarily linked to high levels of uh, mental illness and diagnosis and psychiatric service utilization. Uh, there is some narratives around um, the John B. Keane narrative of, you know, the brothers fighting about the land and all the rest of it. It's not really follows through. If you read the records, read the cases, most people who were admitted to psychiatric hospitals were poor. There was no question of the land or inheritance and so on. So if it wasn't land and if it wasn't private enterprise or industrialization, we have a tendency, and there is a published, uh, you know, there, there is some research on this that would suggest that a uh, colonial oppression, um, that the bad British did this to us good Irish. And while I would be quite amenable to that narrative um, if it made any sense, which it doesn't, uh, our rates of mental hospital utilization went up post-independence uh, rather than down post-independence. Certainly the system and the hard wiring was established within a colonial context. Um, so that's interesting. Also the high rates of utilization of Irish of psychiatric services in the UK um, is actually lower than the uh, level of utilization of services of Irish people in Ireland. So it wasn't this, uh, col this colonial, uh, post-colonial narrative doesn't really uh, help when looking at the Irish case. We have a tendency, and this is an important uh, uh, point to make, to then look to the church, that maybe the church was involved. And this is an important uh, point. Uh, the church state uh, partnership really started in 1832 and then was established in all our other uh, services, social services, maternity services, schools, education, child welfare, our reform schools, industrial schools, magdalene laundries, and so on. However, the church wasn't involved in the uh, psychiatric project, the mental health project, the asylum project, or mental uh, hospital project in Ireland, really because it predated it. So we established these in 1817, which predated Catholic emancipation and that church-state partnership. And that's very interesting because all of the other institutions of uh, residential service institutions in Ireland have had a very strong critical review. And I think this is because we have had um, the church to focus on with this. Um, it's very interesting that the psychiatric system in Ireland hasn't had that same level of review. We have had no regress, for instance, for past residents and so on, as we have had with the church institutions. So all of those large, strong narratives don't really fit the Irish case. There's always the idea that we didn't know about it. Uh, and I think that's very hard to uh, sustain. Um, this is uh, in Killarney, it's just before the Cork Kerry uh, Munster final a number of years ago. And I think it's very difficult for us to suggest that we didn't really know we had this large program of uh, institutional utilization in Ireland. So my research would suggest that it was uh, social forces rather than um, the mental state of the individual that drove institutional utilization and the expansive growth of professional practice, buildings, uh, staffing systems, laws and structures around all of that. Now, I'm not really a historian, I'm a sociologist, and I'm not too interested in history other than what it tells us about the point of now. 
So what difference does this make now? And I think that raises some interesting questions. So some key points, Ireland had the highest rate of mental hospital residency, but it was not driven by the mental state of the admitted individuals. And while that might sound obvious, it still is sometimes the focus of our service intervention that it is the mental state of the individual that should be the focus. Social forces underpinned mental hospital usage uh, rather than the mental state of the individual. And these were predominantly state-run institutions rather than uh, religiously uh, or uh, charitable uh, uh, institutions, while there is examples of them. Also, we need to mention that we have had the expansion of prisons post, uh, and that was mentioned earlier in other papers, Penrose as well, we had the close of mental hospitals and the growth of prisons. And we also have a large number of people, not excluding all people who are homeless, but a large number of people, particularly rough sleepers, who at another time would have really been categorized as having mental health problems rather than being homeless and would have been catered for through the mental hospital system. I'm not suggesting that's a good policy, but I'm just suggesting when we're looking at a uh, human experience, sometimes our, we change the, the, the focus or the lens that we look at those people and then how we respond, respond to them. So this raises a challenge, I think, uh, regarding how do we develop a temporary national response to our mental health difficulties that is not bound and shaped by the structures, systems and professional practices we developed within our historical institutional response to mental illness. So for instance, uh, Joseph's uh, paper on the work of Jigsaw, I thought was really interesting, really innovative, really good practice being developed there. But often those practices are almost an add-on or an extra to the main course, which is the national uh, response, the, which really is built on our uh, traditional institutional responses. Um, same staffing, um, Vision for Change came in, there was no radical uh, closure of our traditional mental hospitals. Indeed, everybody was reassured that nobody would lose their job. We would just go on and um, uh, change our practice. And I think there's limitations to that. I think it's going to be challenging. I think shaping a vision was very much based on vision for change, sharing the vision very much based on vision for change. That's very much based on planning for the future, back to 1984, the Commission of Inquiry, 1967. But really all of those structures and systems were very much established in 1817 and continue to be a key influencer of professional practice and response to uh, mental illness uh, and mental health in Ireland. And I am suggesting that that may be problematic. I think the aspirations in sharing uh, the vision are really good. I, I think, uh, but I, I'm not sure whether our foundations and our institutional trajectory to this point of now can be a limitation to achieving those goals. Thank you. Thanks for that, Dr. Brennan. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on now and try and get some questions in before our break, if we can. So I'm going to begin with, if we can just ask everybody to rejoin us, that would be great. In a sort of a gallery view situation. That's great. Um, I'm going to begin with one that came in from somebody wondering you know, due to current constraints of data protection guidelines, it's so difficult for medical staff to involve families in care planning, especially for 18 year olds against patients' wishes. And that can alienate parents who expect to be involved in the care of their child. And this person's wondering, have the panelists any advice? I might put that to you, Mark. Uh, thanks, John. Um, <laughs> as we're working, working in child services, it, it it doesn't come up as often, but we would yeah. have 16 and 17 year olds who are reluctant sometimes um, to do that. But from the very beginning, when when you would come to a CAM service, we would educate the person on the fact that a care plan will be developed that will be shared with the parents because the goals there are, are as important for the family goals. In, in an adult service, I could see how that could be more difficult. Um, the person might not see the relevance of the family members being involved. But I think, again, it harks back to what I was saying about having more of a an ethos that supports the family unit if we kind of explain and we look at that formulation from the beginning so it needs to make sense to the person um, and if the family members are key to the formulation rather than the diagnosis 
um, then they can see a logic and a sense to why the family members need to be included in it. So I think it, it moves, if we move to more of a systemic ethos and, and see the importance of relationships, then it might make more sense to the person as to why the information could be shared. Sure. Amir, have you thoughts on that? No, I think uh, like Mark has uh, given a fair idea of uh, where we stand. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I have a question here for Martha. Have any nationwide surveys been rolled out where mental health service users provide feedback on their experience and outcomes? And is this information published and used for improvement? Is Martha with us? You need to turn on your mic there, Martha. Can't hear you. Earphones on, so maybe that didn't work. There you work. go. Can you can hear my, you now? <laughs> okay, I have my earphones on, so obviously the mic didn't work. No problem. Uh, yes, mental health reform um, did a survey of people who use services and their family members. Um, so Fiona, oh, she's not here. Um, yes, and that was to, um, and I think services were very surprised by what was written in that report as well. Um, yeah, so it has been done, and I think they're hoping to. Uh, roll that out again it was like a marker when they did a baseline and then do it again in a couple of years time yeah okay um let's see joseph is it not essential that services that work with children and young people come under the one organization when we have the statutory services split our starting point will be from different perspectives should tusla cams and other statutory services perhaps amalgamate a fantastic question. Um, <laughs> anybody who's read the task force report on youth mental health and looked at the recommendations of that, and I can see Mark nodding there in terms of recommendation around Pathfinder, which was that you would have an intergovernmental office, essentially. So the Office for Youth Mental Health, similar to the Office for Children that was a precursor to the department, which would bring together health, uh, justice, education, um, the children's department itself and really look at the integration one of the things we struggle with as a as a as a youth mental health organization is that we um, get funding predominantly through the hse but a lot of our work will be with schools it will be across the whole sector so i think if there was a movement to do that i think it'd be hugely welcomed and i think it's really important to think about about young people and youth affairs and the 12 to 25 year old i think that's a, a an aspect of it as mark has referred to earlier on i think it was one of the questions i saw earlier on somebody was asking why would you um, why is that a recommendation? And what's one of the one of the comments in terms of sharing the vision? It's hugely important because for young people, as I was saying earlier on, and the idea of going into an adult mental health service where the predominantly the, the, the other people in the waiting room might be in their 60s, um, it's really important in terms of having services that are focused on young people. So going back to the original question, the coordination of it, the structure of it, and thinking about it is hugely important because the idea of that a child can, that we can focus on all the children's needs in one government department isn't true because we're all human beings and we've, we've needs across many departments. So it's hugely important that there is that integration. If there was to be, it would make all of our work much, much easier. Mark, have you anything you want to add to that? No, I'd echo. I'd, I'd <laughs> agree with, with everything that, that Joseph has said. Um, I know that there can be uh, some anxieties, I think, about the prospect of extending services, but up until 2015, CAM services didn't accept 16 and 17 year olds. And, and there was huge anxiety about what would happen and the types of difficulties that we would face. And, and when that happened, nothing changed. You know, our, our age range changed a little bit and the average range of people we saw changed, but they were still young people with stories that needed to be heard and it didn't present any more significant challenges beyond the number of referrals that we received, which again, goes back to the point of, if we increase it, provide the resources to make the service mm -hmm. that works. Um, this question now, I'm not 100% sure who I'm going to put it to. I might put it to a few of you. In the document, A Vision for Change, dual diagnosis is acknowledged as needing to be addressed. I have supported service users to engage with day hospitals, and they all state they do not work with service users in addiction. Is there going to be policies and procedures regarding service users who have co-occurring issues, such as mental health and addiction, put in place with the mental health service? So should there be, and maybe how might these work? Amir, do you have yeah, no, uh, As I mentioned earlier on, uh, we are working uh, on the model of care for dual diagnosis as a clinical program. 
and certainly that is not going to be a mental health. I, I think there will be there is already a lot of work done that it should be a joint program between primary care, social care, uh, and mental health, um, including service users, including voluntary organizations who are uh, at the moment delivering services in community. So I think whenever uh, we'll progress to the next stage, we're having a steering group, all of these groups will be involved uh, in final draft of uh, uh, how we are going to deliver it. Okay. Um, this question is for Martha, and I'm going to slightly try and parse it because it's a bit of a long one. Uh, it's got to do with how do you recommend that an inpatient in the throes of mental health subjugation um, develops out their rights? So I think reading the question, it's basically asking, you know, what rights should we focus on while um, a patient is incarcerated? Yeah, and I suppose I, what I was touching on when I said that is medical, uh, mental health treatment ever life-saving or emergency are needed urgently. And I would say in most cases not. So giving a person time and space um, and not rushing in um, to contain and control would help in that. Um, and having other alternatives um, and choices first for people um, yeah so it would be a real change to services I suppose um, definitely because when people are brought in first as well particularly they're very distressed um, mm -hmm. it might have re-traumatized what has gone on before and um, being held down and injected or um, put into a room on your own um, it isn't seen to be helpful um, it may contain and it may be safer for staff and other people in there, but it might be the, for the best for um, the person themselves. Um, and I suppose that's kind of the starting point there. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm just looking at the clock, which I think has beaten us. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up so that we're able to start back at something approximating the time we had scheduled with Dana Spiros. So thank you all so much for your contributions. Um, every chance additional questions that we haven't had a chance to look at now some of our contributors might answer you know online with you in in the on the zoom platform otherwise we were scheduled to start back at 12 35 but we're going to start back at 12 40 because as somebody just pointed out on the message thread the kettle's barely boiled after three minutes so we need to give you a little bit more time so we'll be back at 12 40 for our keynote address from Janus Puris. thanks so much to all of our contributors from the midday session we'll see you shortly Thank you.
Hello, that was a quick break. I hope you're all back with us and you managed to get a cup of tea or a comfort break just in the last few minutes. Professor Paul Fearon is going to introduce our keynote speaker, Danis Puras, rather shortly. But before that, I just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the feedback forms for this event will be sent to you afterwards. And if you could fill them out and return them, that would be great. It's really helpful in trying to put these events together. The other thing is also just to remind you the CPD, if you want to get in touch to get your CPD points, it's communications at stpatsmail.com. That's the housekeeping out of the way. We're going to have some Q&A and discussion at the end of this next speaker's presentation. So I'm going to hand you over to Professor Paul Fear and Medical Director at St. Patrick's. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you very much to all our speakers for a fascinating morning session. So now I'm really delighted to honour uh, and to welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Danis Puras. Danis actually joined us from Lithuania, where he's a professor of child psychiatry and public mental health at Vilnius University. And he's also director of the Human Rights Monitoring Institute, an NGO, again, based in Lithuania. More recently, from 2014 until July of this year, Danis held the mandate of UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Physical and Mental Health. And in this role, he made a really powerful impact in advancing rights-based approaches to mental health care, stimulating necessary debate on issues such as the need to challenge the global mental health status quo. His work has advanced understanding of mental health in society, including recognizing the impact of social injustice and inequalities on our ability to exercise the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, and has firmly placed human rights to the forefront of mental health care in the 21st century. So we're very grateful for him uh, to have him join us today to share his insights. Danish, you're very welcome, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction and for this opportunity to be part of your uh, Founders Day conference. Um, it's a pleasure and honor for me to share my experience, my insights, especially after six years of serving as a uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the right to physical and mental health. So, uh, I would like to elaborate or remind us of lessons from history, and not only Irish, but I think all countries have dramatic history of mental health care, and we have to learn from this. Then, uh, I was trying during my tenure and, and to um, convince critical mass of important people that we need to implement two modern and very effective principles, evidence-based and human rights-based approach. Uh, not only in mental health, but also in mental health. Uh, ironically, these two approaches have been during last 10, 15 years under attacks, as you know, globally. Human rights-based approach and uh, evidence is attacked by all kinds of conspiracy theories. Uh, so human rights-based approach beyond mental health services in all settings, I should say, and within mental health services. The status quo in global mental health, my mandate was global, so I have to, have to cover all regions. And uh, my one of the decisions was to address imbalances and asymmetries, which may may make good ideas uh, turn into wrong way of implementation. And so what is the future of global mental health and uh, uh, psychiatry? So uh, very briefly about the mandate, uh, the UN has very interesting mechanism, unique. The UN appoints special rapporteurs and they are, they are UN and not UN because we, because when you are special rapporteur, you have a mandate, you are a mandate holder, but you are not UN because the main asset is independence. You do not, do not receive salary, it's quite a cruel exercise. Okay, you are covered when you travel, but, but you need to be independent even from UN. 
and only then you can do what is called naming and shaming is needed. Yes, you can make a bold statement that you know this government is violating human rights. This the, and there are many special rapporteurs on different issues and different rights. And uh, my mandate was right to physical and mental health. And you can see here uh, thematic reports which I produced and presented either to UN Human Rights Council based in Geneva or the General Assembly in New York. And many of them have to do with uh, fully or partially on right to mental health. Also, I was having many official country missions when I do report then on implementation of right to health in that country or many informal visits. I also was in Dublin when there was Global World Congress on women's mental health two years ago. And then Women's Coalition brought me to Irish Parliament and then we uh, did lobbying about approaching referendum, you know, about uh, women's rights. So I was proud to symbolically, but to, to contribute to this very important human rights issue. So the, I should say the uh, most, the part of debate, which is more or less consensus is uh, that mental health needs more importance and more funding, more resources. This is agreed. Of course, it should be implemented, yes, but there is not so much political fight about, about this because recently all highest level, you know, politicians in WHO and UN level, they agreed that uh, mental health now is a new priority. Uh, the disagreements start when we discuss, so how we invest. Do we invest in status quo? Or do we, again, not for the first time in history, move to next uh, uh, paradigm? So this is quite a high temperature, I should say, of debate, discourse, and it's far from agreement. And I will elaborate uh, on this also, but uh, for those who are more interested, uh, I recommend the three resolutions of UN Human Rights Council, especially the last one from, from this year, 2020, on mental health and human rights. This is the very strong resolution on human rights and mental health care about how the global community should abandon legacy of uh, uh, institutionalization, violation of human rights of people with intellectual, psychosocial, cognitive disabilities, over medicalization, and I, I stress not, not, it's not against medications, but over medicalization and uh, institutionalization, coercion. So all stakeholders, for all stakeholders, it's high time to, good time, I should say, to rethink their positions nationally, regionally, globally. So first is mental health beyond mental health services. And we all agree that a human rights-based approach is very important, whether it's to prevent violence against children, against women, and many old people, many other groups. And I should summarize maybe this, this part, that all forms of inequalities and violence and discrimination are detrimental to mental health. So if there are attacks on human rights in, in some country regionally, this in long run will be detrimental to mental health, to societal mental health. So uh, states need to invest in enabling non-discriminatory and, and non-violent environments, environments in all settings. And you know, settings are family, school, workplace, community, society, well, and I should add mental health services. Why not to think that they should be also free from force and violence? And there, as you see, delicate, as you know, delicate uh, debate uh, starts. Uh, and of course, crucial role of civil society. We are happy in the European Union and Europe to have quite a good level of democracy, of course, with problems. But you can imagine how many countries uh, have a, a bad record of human rights, bad situation of democracy. And you probably imagine 
what kind of mental health services and how can, for example, psychiatry be, be used even for political purposes, what, what was happening in, in the history. I know this from, from Soviet Union. So, of course, you know history, uh, Irish and global, and it's like a thriller, yes, but I think it's a good drama because with each uh, shift of paradigm, situation was improving. I should say human rights situation was improving after each paradigm, but then after some time, it was time for next paradigm. So we know this unchaining of uh, madmen in France was suggested by Philippe Pinel. I will remind it uh, when I will be finishing my presentation. We know this uh, uh, hope of scientific psychiatry in 19th century to, to diagnose and cure all mental diseases like, like with infectious diseases. We know era of psychoanalysis and psychodynamic approach and then biological psychiatry, 50s and then first medication, then 80s. Prozac era and promises from biological psychiatry to, to, to you know, solve many problems and to eradicate stigma as, as it was promised. Uh, then the institutionalization, which did not happen still in many countries and development of community-based services. And then these attempts to find compromise. Yes, a consensus, biopsychosocial, different success. Then convention of persons with rights of persons with disability comes and this convention confronts uh, biomedical model saying that you know, biomedical model is not a good idea for persons with disabilities. Let's move to social model and then, then there is a reaction from, from psychiatry. So now, uh, 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 as you know, historically, there were this pendulum all the time moving to extremes from mindless brain to brainless mind another way around. We should remember painful stories with lobotomy, but also with anti-psychiatry. And I want to remind you, because I was on the other side of Iron Curtain, effects of Cold War, because we were dreaming, at least in Baltic states, about free world. Like, like your country, maybe many people in your in the West were dreaming about uh, socialism. So I have to say that the Soviet type of socialism was, you know, was uh, Orwellian type of socialism. And they, they decided to hide all people with disabilities and they announced that they do not exist. So it was not uh, a good place for people with any disabilities, including psychosocial disabilities. And since then, uh, this region never had the psychosocial, you know, community-based services because all different people were simply institutionalized in, in horrible places. And in the West, there was another problem, negative effects of capitalism or neoliberalism. So whether you violate economic social rights or you violate civil political rights, in the end, mental health will face detrimental effects. And then there were attempts to reach consensus about human rights in mental health care and how to do with coercion, how to do with non-consensual measures. And this was in the center of my mandate because when I came as special rapporteur, there was a lot of you know things happening in global mental health and I had, had had to formulate position, which is not my position, position of, of the mandate of, of a special rapporteur. And uh, I was, uh, I knew mainly European regions, so I had to spend some time to know what is happening in Asia, Africa, Oceania, Americas, so that I have a, a global picture. And then, then I was moving to my reports. First of all, I want to remind about convention of uh, rights of persons with disability. Irish professor, sorry, Gerard Quinn from Galway, right? Now is a new special rapporteur on, on the rights of persons with disability. I attended summer school as speaker in Galway. Uh, it's a very good center for 
or rights of persons with disability. So we know all these uh, messages from convention and especially important is the last one in this, in this table, which is about tensions between social and medical model that now obstacles are not in, in the brain or legs of person with disability, obstacles are outside. And these obstacles should be removed by concerted efforts of government, civil society and professionals through empowerment, inclusion, participation and non-discrimination. And the same is valid for persons with psychosocial disabilities. So uh, just I put this in my way to show this uh, hot debate or hot talk. And I should say that my mandate was in crossfire while the psychiatric elite, the global and European was uh, suspecting that uh, I am uh, like traitor of psychiatry, being myself psychiatrist, criticize psychiatry, should not behave. So at the same time, passionate human rights activists were suspecting that I'm serving for status quo because I was not insisting uh, differently from CRPD committee to ban all non-consensual measures. And I was looking for some you know, process way to, uh, to how do we move towards uh, uh, reduction of coercion and maybe maybe towards elimination. So this was my compromise, let to say, which was uh, uh, received negative comments from human rights people. So this is how you serve as an independent expert. The main thing is not to please uh, anyone. But back to this, you know, competition be between two mindsets, classical psychiatric uh, position is that maybe I simplify here, but give us opportunity to fix disorders because we're experts. And when we fix disorder, voluntary or by force, then other things may happen. Like this person may live with dignity and exercise human rights. The other side will tell, no, let's finish. Uh, let's end this era of you know violating human rights in the name of medicine and psychiatry and it is not allowed to humiliate persons with uh, you know, the force, with forced placement, forced treatment, and so on. So both sides have argument that they care about dignity, but understanding of dignity is uh, different. And my, my view is there that, okay, there is no hierarchy in human rights. All human rights are equally important and we should not create which human rights are more, more important. Well, we should remind especially medical people to ourselves that the main principle is first do no harm. And uh, I, I, I was looking into medical education schemes. So many medical schools, doctors, future doctors are trained to be as aggressive as possible. And this is the image of good doctor saving lives, yes but maybe in mental health care, it not necessarily is good idea to, to, you know, to, because then we move to all this over medicalization and uh, lobotomy and all these kind of things which were happening. In many parts of the world, I, I came across this, uh, I don't think this happens in Ireland, but like secular argument, that if a person is reluctant to undergo psychiatric hospitalization, then psychiatrists come to the idea that this is additional argument that this person should be hospitalized because how can you disagree with psychiatrist? This is really psychotic. So you see, I, I, I maybe may sound as a little bit ironical or sarcastical, but I think that medical profession, psychiatric profession should analyze self-critically these kinds of uh, observations and complaints from patients, from civil society, and not to be involved in, in fierce defense, you know, that everything is okay. And those who criticize us are simply anti-psychiatrists. So human rights and mental health is very, very interesting uh, debate is going on, meaningful, but we should not expect some peace agreement soon. A peace agreement is not a war, it's, it's 
conflict of different ideas. But as we know, psychiatry differently from other parts of medicine has a tradition to override human rights of persons uh, with mental health conditions and the principle of informed consent. So is the, do we like to use this as psychiatrists as often as possible? Or do we decide that this is against the uh, principles of medical profession? This was the issues which I was raising when I was meeting representatives of psychiatry. Um, and as we know, mental health laws in all countries allow to use inv involuntary measures, forced placement and treatment. And there are two arguments be be behind this, dangerousness and medical necessity. Well, I have a lot of uh, arguments, evidence that these both arguments are lacking uh, serious evidence. Uh, so these exceptions, the problem that if we allow these exceptions globally, especially where there are problems with democracy, with transparency, with uh, uh, human rights, these exceptions stand into the rules. And globally, I could see, you know, thousands of people locked in, in, in all kinds of institutions because they were diagnosed, because they were diagnosed as having mental uh, disorder. And then the cycle of the discrimination, stigmatization, and uh, helplessness was uh, uh, reinforced. So um, there are many challenges with status quo. Uh, you know that globally there is a dramatic increase of prescriptions of psychotropic medication. without in many parts of the world up to quarter 25 percent of uh, of uh, uh, women uh, have uh, uh, using antidepressants and so on question is on the rise uh, in many countries uh, and so on so this uh, this um, uh, finally uh, in one of my reports in 2017 I um, formulated, this uh, diagnosis of systems, let's say, that uh, there is a global burden of obstacles and I formulated three main global obstacles. Dominance of biomedical model and overuse of biomedical intervention. Again, overuse, power of asymmetries, uh, power asymmetries be between providers and users of services and this disempowers, it does not empower and also between doctors and non-doctors, uh, power asymmetries, and then biased use of knowledge and evidence because medical students are learning from textbooks where they read that uh, mental health conditions have uh, a biological determination. And then if you have uh, this depression, you have, to, you have to address chemical imbalance. Yes, so this, this has led to some uh, you know, wrong uh, direction, and we have to stop to think a little bit and uh, and to to agree maybe that that we should uh, make some some changes in in policies and services. So most important, as I as I formulated in my reports, is to address determinants of mental health, inequalities, poverty, discrimination, violence. Uh, in other words, rather than trying to fix brains, we should, uh, we should uh, um, somehow address uh, relationships, which are very often based on, on violence, on mistrust, and, and so on. And then uh, um, I moved to some recommendations, which uh, come from these conclusions, because if there is power asymmetries, so let's empower users of services and other stakeholders, and let's, uh, let's uh, uh, Let's invest in alternative mental health services, support models. You know, opponents of classical psychiatry, they do not suggest to leave these people in streets. This is wrong, wrong. Uh, I, I hear very often that, you know, one side wants to treat people, other side wants to leave them in streets. No, there are many emerging uh, um, rights-based non-coercive services also in global south and they are innovative. Yes, we have to look how it goes, like, you know, Finnish model, open dialogue and so on, but there are many uh, 
good ideas how we should at least try to uh, to uh, manage mental health conditions without uh, uh, coercion. And you know, this uh, my report from 2017, and then I had two more reports, sparked a lot of responses. Yes, I don't hide, this was my idea to meaningfully provoke. The polarization always existed. I did not create it. This, this was just revealed by reports because all uh, stakeholders uh, supported main messages, uh, just uh, there were responses from World Psychiatric Association, European Psychiatric Association, uh, negative, critical, because the understanding was that I attacked, attacked uh, psychiatry and such reports could uh, uh, destroy therapeutic relationship between psychiatrists and patients, something like that. So then I, I, among my recommendations were the, to develop a roadmap to radically reduce coercive measures. I reached very good agreement with German Psychiatric Association. They told, okay, we are not ready to abandon fully coercion, but we are ready to substantially reduce and to, to, to monitor this reduction and to create all this de-escalation and other techniques. So very good. This, this, this. I could not even dream about something, something more. Um, so, uh, in in moving to maybe to uh, conclusion, uh, yes, I am on the side of next thing uh, shift of paradigm, because when I was asked, so how you will give title of press release. Revolution, you ask for revolution. I told no, no revolution. People don't like revolution. But sir, so do you want evolution? I told no, evolution does not work. For 40 years, it's clear that this status quo as it is now simply does not work. But I have enough arguments for, for this. Uh, at least advanced countries like, like your country, like UK, like Germany, Canada, they are doing okay, let's say quite well, but the messages they send to the rest of the world are taken by rest of the world in selective way that coercion is okay, that over-medicalization is okay, that paternalistic approach is okay. If we don't say other, other way, we always, uh, people know how to uh, take messages, you know, as you wish. And then globally we have, uh, uh, systemic failure with mental health services. The more resources, I have a lot of example, if you get more resources in many parts of the world, they go to uh, building or renovating huge uh, closed institutions. This is how status quo uh, works. So again, I, I remind that I speak about global picture, not just about one uh, country. So, uh, there are many issues for serious debate, and this debate is going on. It's meaningful. Sometimes it's very uh, hot, you know, temperature. I, uh, I attended round table meetings which failed because, you know, there was such a big tension between, let's say, two classical groups that uh, some of them, uh, that just meeting failed, yes, because of, of uh, huge dis disagreement. And uh, uh, some words about COVID. Uh, the COVID, yes, COVID reveals all these issues even more. And COVID, for me, maybe this is what I have written here is also important. But now I think that for me, most important are two things. Uh, two things in COVID situation, we realize. Shall we medicalize again all these people who are now feel elevated anxiety because they react quite normally to abnormal situation, yes? But they feel not well. Maybe they have sleep problems. They are too anxious. So many countries in the world, there is a lot of advertisements that go to psychiatrists and the psychiatrist will medicate you because you are ill. You, you, we will diagnose you. And then, so it's again, it will be new wave of medicalization of, 
of human life. And I think it's not, not wise, not wise and it's not effective and it may be harmful. Other thing is institutional care. You do not have uh, this problem anymore in, in Ireland. Uh, I mean, uh, of large institutions, but there are a lot of them in Eastern Europe, European funds go to renovate huge institutions in, in, in uh, my country, you know, because this is, this is how system works, you know. We medicalize people, then we tell it does not work, and we institutionalize them. And when COVID comes and, uh, and uh, this institution become hotspots for contagion. So it's a alarm bell for these systems. Let's do something different. This system does not work. Uh, so, uh, uh, some final observations. I had no time to speak about uh, child adolescent uh, uh, mental health, which is my first love, so to say, my, my background, my pro profession. And as you know, we have very good uh, new neuroscience research now that quality of brain and quality of body and how the body will react to stress through entire life depends on how we manage toxic stress in infancy. In other words, if we invest properly, properly in quality of human interactions between baby and parents, we can do a lot for mental and physical health. This is key for solution. This is vaccine, so to say. So a chicken and egg problem is back, maybe not in Freudian way, but the primary thing is the quality of human uh, uh, relationships or in other words, social determinants of mental health define if societies and individuals will have uh, poor or bad uh, or good uh, mental and physical health. And as you know, some 10, 20 years ago, students and residents were taught in medical schools that, you know, forget all the psychological theories, just it's all about brain. So now again, back, we, we understand that a lot uh, about mental ill health depends on what happened with us in our lives. So this, I think, is very important to know and all this uh, adverse childhood experience, you know, way is extremely important for child and adult uh, mental health and mental, mental ill health. So then invest in all supportive environments. So otherwise, human rights should be protected in all settings. And this is best vaccine. Avoid over medicalization, coercion and institutionalization. Of course, more money is needed for mental health services. But let's address these imbalances and these uh, uh, asymmetries in, in the system. First, do no harm, and uh, persons with mental health conditions, as well as all the field, including the service providers, should be empowered and liberated from legacy of, I should say, discriminatory laws, practices, attitudes. Because it's, this field is still trapped by legacy of, of the, the discrimination in many respects. So I like this quote from famous human rights activist. He was doctor who was working very much for UN uh, in the time of AIDS epidemics. And as you know, AIDS epidemics did a lot for human rights based, based approach in, in medicine because a researcher told to political leaders, if you don't stop discriminating people like uh, injecting people uh, sex workers, uh, homosexual people, then uh, you will be, you will have uh, huge epidemics. And this was scientific recommendation to apply human rights based approach. So now I have a dream that in mental health, we could uh, apply human rights based approach. And Jonathan Mann told the human rights framework provides more useful approach for analyzing and responding to modern public health challenges than any framework thus far available within the biomedical tradition. So these are what doctors are telling, not just philosophers. Rudolf Virchow, father of pathology, told uh, in 19th century, uh, medicine is actually a social science. And I very much agree. And psychiatry even more is 
in social science, I think, and practice. And I, 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 I see good future of psychiatry, which is to a large extent uh, social psychiatry, of course, do not losing the best what it has from biomedical model, but not, not, uh, not excessive. So this is what I told, uh, I will say in the end, this is back to 200 years ago. This picture is about, uh, uh, you know, events in France, Salpetier, uh, and why I, I, I chose it for my closing remark. When Philippe Nel suggested this revolution to unchain madmen, just to unchain, to improve, as we say now, quality of life, yes? Because listen how they scream in dungeons. If we unchain them, they scream not so much and maybe our life is better also. So they went to dungeons and then they met these people and these people were, uh, you know, how to tell in English, I don't know, misbehaving. Yes, it will be soft, soft uh, way to, to to, to tell how they were behaving, spitting and kicking and so on. And then this Couton, the government person, looked at Pinel and told, citizen, are you maybe mad yourself that you suggest to unchain this madman? Mad, mad Look how they began. And Pinel replied 200 and more years ago, citizen, just for you to know, they behave so because we deprived them of air and liberty. So especially I want to highlight liberty. 200 years after, we have the same situation. We go to some uh, institution in, in the many parts of the countries, we see people with very bad conditions and many people, including psychiatrists tell, you see how disease destroyed this person. The scientific answer would be that this was not disease which destroyed this person, because with the same condition in other country, this person could be, you know, in much better shape. This is our attitudes, our our cons our discrimination by consensus, our legacy destroyed uh, these persons, and this is, I think, uh, um, uh, some alarm bell to all of us that we. Uh, we are doing not, not so badly, but we can do globally much better if we say goodbye to some, some you know, conventional wisdoms, which are, not, which are not so effective, so to say. So this, this was my idea to share, share with you some insights and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Puras. That was just fantastic. And we've had so many people sending in positive comments throughout your presentation. They really, all of the people that are joining us really enjoyed it. Just I'll share some of those comments with you. Martha Griffith, Griffin, who was one of our speakers earlier, wanted to thank you for your fantastic reports during your time as Special Rapporteur. Somebody else was very interested in your comments regarding the erosion of human rights regarding choice and society and how these are, how they're being eroded and the implications for going along just to sort of get along in institutions and the need to challenge those situations where appropriate. So they wanted to thank you for your input on that matter too. I'm going to invite Professor Paul Fearon back to join us and we might just have a little bit of discussion and put some questions to Danis. If you're there, Professor Fearon. I am. Yes, it's great. <laughs> Thank Davis, first, firstly, thank you so much for that forthright and very passionate um, plea for human rights. And I think it, it, it gives us an awful lot to reflect on, uh, whatever our discipline within mental health. I suppose it struck me, and I suppose that this encapsulates a few questions, so apologies. In the morning session, we've been talking about um, the state of our mental health services, and there have been various themes that um, have emerged. A service user involvement um, at all stages of services funding, particularly transparency funding and effective use of that funding um, in terms of measuring outcomes and um, particularly uh, vulnerable groups who maybe um, not get as good care as they might, uh, for instance, young people. Um, and another theme, obviously, and, and you'll be glad to hear, has been human rights, 
And in one sense, one could argue that that's another priority, but another way of looking at it is that that's actually the theme that undercuts and cuts through all of these other things. If we have a focus on human rights, then we deal with all of these particular issues well. And so my specific question, sorry for the uh, big lead in, um, given that we're under a lot of pressure in terms of COVID funding, et cetera, et cetera, should we be um, sorting these things out and then looking at human rights as another priority? Or should we start from the focus, and I think you've partly answered this already, um, should we be starting on prioritizing a human rights-based approach from the ground up, and this will help us solve our other issues? Um, okay, thank you. Um, if I understand uh, the question correctly, I, uh, I would like to comment uh, this based on my experience uh, from my last months, because when I was finishing already my mandate, uh, pandemic started. And it was, oh, and travels were closed already. So there were a lot of uh, remote meetings with the Human Rights Council, which are you know, country representatives, uh, diplomats. And it was very dramatic moment because uh, uh, some countries were using this uh, uh, moment to continue attacks on human rights. Maybe not, uh, I mean, with good intentions, but you know, the game was that you are, your mandate is important because you are right to health. So let's save lives together. And to save lives, let's freeze other human rights. And then I told, no, <laughs> you cannot exercise the human, even especially before pandemics, after pandemics, but especially during public crisis, human rights become even more important with the known restrictions, yes? These are well described and we know, of course, sometimes as we now understand epidemiologists, also not very exact science, <laughs> also psychiatry, this was very interesting to, to see how, you know, how famous scientists do not, uh, necessarily agree on, on how this virus, you know, is provoking us, you know. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I, uh, because they were telling, let's have a dialogue with the rapporteur on health and let's, let's discuss how to save lives. I told, no, let's have dialogue with group of rapporteurs, including freedom of, uh, you know, assembly or you know, whatever. And let's discuss how to protect human rights because there is no other way to, to, uh, to address effectively such crisis. And this was, the, the same was with AIDS, you know, the, of course these are different uh, epidemics, but the, the main uh, principles are the same. Um, uh, right to physical health, right to mental health can be exercised only in synergy with uh, other rights. If for any reasons we, uh, you know, we ignore some rights, what I was telling by example of Cold War, yes, because the two, two camps were disqualifying each other and two, both camps were going selective way. And, and we have now proofs that in both camps there were problems with, with societal mental health, let's say. So something similar I see with uh, uh, COVID because we need, governments need to uh, win trust of people if they want to, to, you know, to manage crisis. And if they manipulate, if they hide, if they uh, move to discriminatory, non-proportionate, uh, you know, measures, then it will be failure. And about mental health, well, I would, my, my remarks were about uh, good, uh, good, uh, opportunity to move to some creative ways of supporting people, caring people, not necessarily medicating them for any, you know, mental health condition. And also what is important to, to many regions uh, to, to think about uh, uh, abandoning legacy of institutional care, even for old people, you know, of course we, somebody can tell, you are so clever, please tell what to do. I don't know, but let's, Let's challenge, let's, let's decide that this is not the best way to say to old people, you're, you will go to institution. You know, maybe we can still 
uh, think creatively of some. So sorry, I don't know if if my uh, response was <laughs> in that direction. Or are you expecting? No, that's fine. I just wanted to know. I think you've answered that, that the primacy of uh, human rights in everything that we do is essentially the nub of what I rather long-windedly asked. And I think you've mm -hmm. answered. Please, thank you. I wonder, we have a question, sorry, Paul, that had come in that's an interesting one, I think, based on what you were talking about, Mr. Pereira. So one of our attendees is wondering if you believe that the attempts to dislodge the importance of evidence-based and human rights-based educational practice in mental health policy is leveled not only by conspiracy theorists, as you noted in your presentation, but by those with maybe vested interests and power in the current medicalized program. What would your thoughts be on that? Uh, yes, you know, I, I, uh, in some of reports, I was also testing uh, patients of some maybe colleagues because uh, uh, I wanted really sometimes to make uh, um, quite open statements Okay, about corruption in mental health care. One, one of my reports was uh, corruption in healthcare in general. So globally, health, health sector is most corrupt sector. What can I do? I have to, I have at least to, to, to confirm, to tell this. That, so, so let's think what is behind this, that the most noble field is most corrupt. Very good uh, moment for analysis, you know, for, 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 how hypocritical maybe we are, I don't know. In my region, it's still uh, services are based on relations. If you know somebody you call boss of hospital and they, they will help your relatives. So this corruption, but people tell, no, 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 health is so important that of course you have to take, uh, and also good Catholics do this, you know. They, <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so sorry for this. Maybe not not directly related to mental health, but uh, yes. And in one chapter, one chapter in this report was on how big pharma, you know, influenced uh, this uh, new paradigm. Yes, since eighties. So what? And then some colleagues were asking, but why did you choose the psychiatry if all health uh, uh, medical specialties are corrupted? <laughs> so why, why are you so bad? Why don't you choose internal diseases? But because I know this better. I, I know how, how this came, like Baltic states had huge uh, suicide rates, you know, uh, during societal transition. And uh, we were expecting that now people from West will come with uh, um, ideas how to um, introduce psychosocial interventions because Soviets ne never had this. They had very brutal biological. Instead, you know, <laughs> big professors started to come to tell that we have Prozac now and uh, give Prozac to everyone and people will be happy. So this was disappointment. Uh, my observation, maybe more, uh, more, more, let's say, targeted to the question, if we compare uh, child adolescent psychiatry and adult psychiatry, as we know, uh, child adolescent psychiatry is not so based so much based on biological model. And then, and for me, it's advantage, but my colleagues tell, but, but we are so weak, we have to become like adult psychiatry, we have to become so by medicalized and then we will be strong. And you know, and I understand what people mean because yes, child psychiatry is not so strong politically as adult psychiatry, but I would not agree to, to become more biomedical so that you demonstrate more power. I think that uh, child adolescent psychiatry is very good of example of, 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 of medicine, which is like social medicine where you do not need so uh, you know, expensive biomedical things, and still this is healthcare. Um, so yes, uh, vested interests uh, in, in important. This is why recommendation to address power asymmetries, I think is helpful uh, and healthy for psychiatric profession. And we had this discussion with the leaders of global and European psychiatry uh, that if psychiatry, let's say, shares power with others, 
it's maybe not so powerful, but maybe it's better for image and reputation and for, for health, right? Because, you know, to pretend that you are God and you know everything, uh, what is happening with mental health, it's a little bit funny, you know, because we, we know that there are no markers. We know that uh, in some high profile cases when uh, some, you know, forensic uh, investigation is made on, on famous, uh, a person in Norway who committed, you know, this massive killing. You know in advance that there will be commission which will find a mental illness and there will be another commission which will not find mental illness because half of psychiatry is, is philosophy and, and social science. But if psychiatry wants to pretend that it is exact science, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit funny, you know. And, no, no, not funny, but I think it, it, it is not, does not lead to effective uh, solutions. And I strongly disagree because when it is, uh, I strongly disagree that what people are telling like this, and to my estimation, about 10% of psychiatrists globally are, you know, <laughs> are troublemakers. <laughs> so it's not anti-psychiatry. It's other, it's other view of psychiatrists because immediately you are labeled, you know, huh? Uh, he's against medication, so he's anti-psychiatrist. I'm not against medications, I am against improper use of medication. So mm. improper use of medications spoil the reputation of medications and psychiatry. So, so it's not anti-psychiatry. So, sorry for <laughs> this. No, not at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm conscious that you're under time pressure and you've been so generous with your time. And if this wasn't a Zoom call and it was an in-person conference, you would feel the warmth that there is for you. We're getting comments and saying, oh, he's great and we really appreciate his work. And, you know, I have no doubt that there would be a massive round of applause if we were in a room together. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you um, we're all very grateful for you taking the time to come and speak with us and, um, you know, take care and thanks for your time. Paul, is there anything you want to say in conclusion? I'd just like to add your thanks to Dana, but to all our speakers today. I think it's been a, a really interesting, fascinating uh, day. And I think uh, a lot of themes have emerged. And um, as I said at the outset, we're going to compile a list of the main learning points from today and disseminate it uh, back to people. Um, and hopefully uh, we can continue working towards our ultimate goal, which is, after all, for all of us, regardless of our where we're coming from, which is to provide the best quality human based human rights based care for everybody that comes uh, looking for our help. So thank you. Everybody. Thank you. And just as some closing housekeeping remarks, if you receive your feedback form, please do submit it. It's very helpful to the team at St. Patrick's in uh, curating further events. And also, if you wish to get CBD points for this event, please email communications at stpatsmail.com. Thank you all for your time, your patience and your contributions. They've all been really valuable and we'll be in touch in due course with any of the learning outcomes that Paul referenced there around key themes, etc. Enjoy the rest of your evening. If you're watching the toy show, who isn't? Have a great time and no doubt our paths will cross again soon. Take care. <laughs>